Welcome back to WRPL, the podcast where we talk about all the things we are watching, reading, playing, and listening to. My name's Ben. And I'm Steve. How you doing, Steve? I'm doing well, Ben. How are you? I am excellent. Uh, do Let's go right off the bat. Do you have any new cream soda news? Uh, I do, actually. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was at ShopRite mm-hmm. and going down the soda aisle, and I it, it was a little bit on the pricer end, but I was like, you know what? Let me let me try it out because this this is my new thing, uh, and I tried Hank's Gourmet Vanilla Cream okay. Soda. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I, it was like five bucks for a four pack. Oh Jesus! Yeah, I mean they were big, uh, you know, twelve ounce mm-hmm. uh, glass tall bottle. boys, tall boys. Yeah, <laughs> um, and I gotta say they they were really good. I I would like to uh, get another pack. Mm-hmm. And then, like, do a taste test between this and the Great Value brand. Oh, if we're going to do a taste test, we need to go all out and just get as many types it. as we can <laughs> and just record ourselves trying them all. Just do, uh, what did we consume this week? Nothing but cream Nothing sodas. Nothing but cream soda. And just kill ourselves with sugar. <laughs> okay, I'm down for it. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I wasn't sure if anything was going to top the, the Great Value brand of cream mm-hmm. soda because I thought it was just, like, a good base. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a difference between cream soda and vanilla cream soda. Yeah, Because I feel like cream soda is essentially is vanilla. vanilla yeah. yeah. Um, but specifically, there was vanilla. So I wasn't 100% sure how hmm. you, you would classify that. Yeah. Uh, if it was like pure cream soda. Whatever. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah, really, really good. Um, I'm also more of a, a can fan versus a bottle fan. I mm-hmm. feel like in bottles, like it warms up faster. Sure. And like for whatever reason, it takes longer to drink. Where like a 12 ounce can, yeah. like you, it's just like the perfect. Delivery system for drinks <laughs> for me, uh, but yeah. So uh, next time, next week, I'll buy another pack and we'll, we'll okay. Have some. Well, uh, I'll or, keep my eyes open for other cream sodas available. You know, I'll pick up an A and W in a mug. Yeah, and... I've been looking for an A and W. Can't find them. Huh? Um, oh, it's like I, I'll go to stores and I'll see the, or like I'll look for Stewart's too. I'll see Stewart's orange cream soda. Mm. I'll see Stewart's diet regular, whatever. But I can't find yeah, no, like uh, the two most popular brands that I would think cream soda yeah. would be. Can't find them. Uh, did you ever? I mean, maybe you were too young to remember. And I was living in Nebraska at the time, but Barks had a red cream soda. Do you, oh, do you remember that? No. Yeah, I don't remember it being like cherry or anything, but I remember it being really good. Yeah. Uh, but it was just you know Nebraska is a test market for a lot of those things, so it just didn't it didn't take <laughs> off. So because no one cares about the <laughs> Midwesterners. No, anything. they're the normal folks. They're your everyday people. So like that's that's who you want to sell to, right? Not sure, the but elites. Like also, if the product kills people in Nebraska, no oh yeah, no cares. one cares about they're that. They're like the guinea pig state. <laughs> And then we'll deliver it to like the major east yeah. and west coast market. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, like we we had um, Taco Bell's were serving French fries back in the early two thousands for a short time. They were mm-hmm. crinkle cut fries, nothing special about them. They were just French fries, and so that didn't work. And luckily, they they were smart about their their latest ones. Um, I also tried a new soda, not a cream soda, but it was the Coca Cola Dreamland, and I have not heard of this. Yeah. Uh, it's gross. It's like <laughs> mango NyQuil. It's so medicine-y tasting. It, it's awful. And they were like, you know the the DJ Marshmallow? Or, yeah. Yeah. He had one as well. Also tasted just like oh, medicine. I've seen that. Nasty. They, I've seen the cans, and I was like, oh, those are cool looking cans. I mean, okay. I don't give a shit about Marshmallow, but from a visual standpoint, I'm like, oh, that would it draw was a, my attention. Yeah. But like, I don't, is it supposed to be a marshmallow flavored soda? Because if it is, it didn't taste like it. Just once again, it was another medicine flavor thing. And what the fuck is up with Coke? They cannot get these like unique flavors. Whereas Mountain Dew has a new flavor every year and they're all pretty much winners. None of them are really that gross. Right. You know, it's interesting that uh, Coke is kind of the quintessential soda uh, I saw a comment recently because you and I are big fans of movies, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and someone talking about like Regal versus AMC mm. on uh, Reddit, and they talked about you know Regal really because they were talking about the Cine World uh, buyout of Regal, yeah, like they're, yeah, and, and then they're, they're going, like, <laughs> they're filing for bankruptcy. Filing bankruptcy. Regal was so smart; they yeah. got out at the right time. Uh, but it was funny because like they said. Cine, uh, Regal went downhill when they switched to Pepsi. Absolutely, <laughs> Pepsi's and, gross. And uh, I mean, I Pepsi, uh, Mountain Dew is a Pepsi product, yeah. and I I fully support Mountain, Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew is great. Mountain Pepsi Dew is, is bad. Uh, Unless you want to sponsor us, Coke Pepsi, is then the you're the best. Qu- Coke is the quintessential soda yeah. at everywhere. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's it's so weird they keep making like other bad versions of their own product, which is considered the best soda on the planet. Yeah. Uh, interesting stuff. Yeah. 
So don't buy Coke Dreamland. Nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, I wanted to talk real quick on a few things. Uh, Westworld came to an end. Loved it. I mean, not oh, this season came to an end. Well, hopefully we'll get a season five. No, no word yet. Does it end in a way that feels like if we don't come back, this is finale enough? Or is it like, we're going to end this in a way where it's like, you no. better pray that we get it. <laughs> no, it, it's, it would be fine and you could make a lot of assumptions, but no, I mean, we need like one more. With that kind of show, there's no way it wouldn't end with a bunch of assumptions. Yeah. Because it's so... Pretty vague and smart, and, yeah. and vague or whatever. <laughs> uh, but I highly recommend it. It it had a few stumbling blocks here and there, but I really loved this last season. Uh, she Hulk premiered. I thought it was relatively charming. I I enjoy. It. I wish there was more of the law side. It's more of her origin mm-hmm. and testing her powers. Sure. And uh, Bruce is kind of annoying in it. He really gets under my skin, where he he's trying to tell her like this is going to be a multi-year thing of you coming to terms with this and she proves almost instantly that she could handle it and she's not going into rage mode like he did and he still just like will not let it go and he it's a little frustrating um but and is it just like it, he won't let it go for like a comedic effect of the show no or like he, he's genuinely concerned and uh wants her to just like stay put and keep training and she's like i, I don't need this shit and it's it's annoying. You just have to watch it. Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how how would you say it compares to the other Disney Plus show in terms of like pilot episodes, not in terms of the whole shows altogether? I think it's a pretty good pilot. It really sets the world up well, especially with her talking to the camera and. Um, oh, it's like breaking the fourth wall. Kind yeah. Of stuff? Okay. Yeah. She she's very much a Deadpool like character in in the comics, and so I'm glad that translated over. Some of the CG looks great. Some of it, not as much. I wish she was bigger, though. I guess they did make her much bigger, but Disney kept going like, no, no, no. She's too big. She's too big. It's like, we need her to be sexy buff. We don't need her to be scary buff. So they had to keep scaling her down, and she's she's just not that big. She's only like a foot taller than her normal self. Like, She-Hulk should be real right. big. I mean, I guess in terms of comic bookness, like, it really... If you're going for accuracy, yes, it, it matters. But, uh, like, if you have powers, like, Captain America it just looks like a dude, but he can, like, you know. Sure. I mean, he, I mean, that's not the best example because he's just a super strong human versus, mm-hmm. like, someone with, you know, s- s- extreme superpowers. But yeah. it's like, you can have her be smaller and be just as strong as... I, sure. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying, like, I kind of get it if that's the route you want to go for. Because, like, you don't have to, like... She Make doesn't have big. to be as big as the Hulk because she never was that in the comics right, of no, being like real wide, but she should be much taller and, and just rippling with muscles. And she That's just looks like I would a, like to see. I'm just saying I get from a they, company I, standpoint yeah, where you go like, it the company matter. says can, it's not sexy enough, sure. you know? Oh, we can't get guys to watch this show if our lead actress is not hot enough to look at. And if you make her too muscular, not everyone's into that. And it just, it seems really shitty. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll keep watching it every Thursday. And uh, down is, sorry, does Mark Ruffalo show up or is it just? Yeah, no, he he is. Um, and so they do explain why in Shang Chi he's regular Bruce and not uh, Hulk. He has a little patch on him that's a regulator that allows him to become human when he wants, and when it comes off, he's just uh, smart Hulk all the time. So, okay, yeah. Uh, and then. Uh, a spinoff of one of your favorite shows, Tales of the Walking Dead. Okay. Had its first episode, second episodes tonight. I'll, I'll watch it. Uh, it wasn't bad at first. <laughs> Actually, I really... Listen to en- how you said that. I know. Sense. I really enjoyed it at first, and then it got kind of dumb. So, quick, quick rundown. Terry Crews, he's a doomsday prepper. He saw something happen. Or, or not, he, he saw something was going to happen. So he has a great little bunker filled with all of his stuff. And it's like 400 plus days after the zombie apocalypse. And he's thriving. He's got his dog and yada, yada, yada. And he's before it all went to shit, he was uh, talking online with another prepper. And they're just like really clicked. and But they never were able to meet. So then after his dog gets bit, because the dog's kind of old and uh, gets attacked, he realizes, I need to go out there and find this woman and 
He runs across Olivia Munn, who's a hippy dippy chick who has also survived because she's, you know, like good at gardening and and uh, she's able to feed herself and uh, she's able to knit uh, net traps and stuff. She puts on a lot of essential oils. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Uh, repels, repels all the dead the zombies. Yeah, because they're just like, oh, that smells terrible. I don't want to eat yeah. that. Yeah. So they have to do the oh, you're gonna take. She's also finding her her lost love at a cabin and it just happens that they're relatively close. So I'm like, okay, we gotta work together. They don't like each other and they don't trust each other, then they learn to like each other and it's then, like uh, seeking friends at the end of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they really kinda of butt heads like like where she's holding a gun on him the whole time, like oh. forcing him to take her with him. Uh, and then they eventually get to their locations. She the guy that she was looking for is not there. Um, so she could assume he's dead. And then Terry Crews finds his woman and she has a crazy bunker and uh, everything seems like, oh, I can't believe you took the risk to come find me. This is great. And she gives him like a pot brownie and it makes him pass out. And then when he wakes up, she's got like clown makeup on and she's just like, you're like all the other men just trying to get my bunker. Everyone knocks on, on my door. They think that, that they're being nice, but they just want my stuff. And yeah, so then Olivia Munn shows up. But of course, then she's a hippy dippy, uh, ch- uh, hippy dippy. You got it. Since she's a hippie chick, uh, the pot brownie doesn't really work on her and they have a little fight oh my god and then uh like sounds so dumb. she saves him and then he like throws a knife in her chest and kills the clown girl and then they're like all right i guess we can make the world a better place and they leave which is really dumb because it's like you have a, a bunker stocked with stuff just stay there and open it to other people but so it like it had me and then i don't care that she's a, a crazy psycho person who you know it, after over a year of by yourself you can go crazy especially if people have been trying to get in and take your stuff uh but why the clown makeup <laughs> that i did not understand because she wasn't it's not like she was wearing nice makeup and just in the heat of a fight it smeared and looked clownish he fell asleep woke up and she was got... in her mouth and she didn't no like, no but it, but it is very light like she just put it in her hand real quick wiped her eyes wiped her mouth um but it is kind of very harley quinn of like one's blue one's red and mm-hmm. yeah real real stupid but this tonight's episode i think is like a groundhog's day thing where Parker Posey and oh, what's her name? She was in uh, Workaholics and oh yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about yeah, the, yes. Uh, like I guess they get stuck in a loop every time they die. They come back, uh, which is very different for a Walking Dead story. You don't get kind of higher concepts than yeah. just zombies. So I'm interested to watch that. Uh, but I think that's that's the little stuff. So let's get into some of our bigger topics. Oh, and I didn't even say our main topic of today is Better Call Saul. The season and series came to a close after, was it like eight years, six seasons? Uh, yeah, it premiered in 2015, so this would have been seven years. Seven years, six okay. Seasons, yeah. And, um, you know, having you know main characters almost die on set and huge cliffhangers, and it's, it's a, a long time coming, and I, I'm very excited to talk about it. All right. Well, first, let me talk about my stuff. Okay. Uh, so, real quick, uh, something I played, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 on the mm. PS4. It was one of the free games this month. Uh, it was This was a cherished uh, childhood memory for me, uh, playing these levels that have now gotten the update and just better graphics, uh, you know, custom creator stuff. Uh, it it's I haven't... I was never a skateboard kid, Mm -hmm. um, and I don't particularly care about skateboarding, uh, but obviously in the early 2000s, like the X Games and Tony Hawk and Matt Hoffman, like they were everywhere. Uh, So getting to play this again after all this time, like I wouldn't have paid for this game, but I'm glad it was free Mm because I'm having a ton of fun with it. And there is something to just jumping up in the air really like beyond human capability mm-hmm. and then doing a 900 landing and then just like doing five 900s in a row yeah <laughs> you know, grinding you, a whole freeway for yeah. a mile yeah. um getting hit by a train and falling through a crack and hit by a taxi and just get up and you know yep. whatever it's just a ton of fun um that you would think would get uh tiresome after a while kind of like doing the same tricks over and over again but it's just a lot of fun so uh highly recommend that uh Something I read 
was uh, a buddy let me borrow the first volume of a manga called Monster. Um, right. I think this is a pretty uh, beloved comic. Um, based, and what I like about it is it's not... I'm a young 16-year-old who's going to school to become a hero or, mm-hmm. like, I have a sudden power. It's a grown man. He's a doctor. and He's working in a hospital uh, in Germany. He's Japanese, and he is, like, the best doctor in, the, in all of Germany, possibly. Um, and the story is he, he's dating the daughter of the head of the hospital, at, or the hospital director, and he's, like, this up-and-coming hotshot and everything. And uh, this little, there's a murder. Um, the uh, this, these parents uh, get murdered, and the there's a boy who has a gunshot wound to his head, and then a daughter who had seen the crime, mm-hmm. and he goes to the hospital to save this boy's life, and the like the mayor or something is like in critical condition. They're just like, you need to operate on the mayor. And he's like, well, this little boy came in first and he kind of needs me. And, like, there's a little bit of a uh, thing that happened earlier that's kind of, like, why he, like, disobeyed the order. He's like, I'm going to save this boy. Mm-hmm. And then the, the other doctors are ca- perfectly capable of like, sure. saving the mayor. But, like, this little boy needs me. Like, I'm the best. He's got a gun. <laughs> he's got a bullet in his head. Like, he, I need to do this surgery. And so he saves the little boy. Mayor dies. And then the director is just like, fuck you. I'm not – you're never going to move up. Is uh, – fiance the daughter of the hospital director just like you're a fucking loser i'm out of here like she's like (laughs) the worst character okay um and the long story short the little boy grows up he becomes a serial killer (laughs) and so he feels responsible uh that he saved this little boy's life like he Mm -hmm. made a point like i did the right thing Mm -hmm. and it still came back to bite me because i saved the person who's going around uh murdering people and the I, the daughter like went to uh, other like another foster family and so now that serial killer boy and like it's not a spoiler to say that the boys like you find out super early on that the boy grows up to be the serial killer mm-hmm. um, and so it's now the doctor years later trying to track this guy down because he feels he's responsible for him being around and it's just really good it's a really interesting it like it feels like it'd be a David Fincher film okay uh and it's just really cool and I'm really interested and there's uh eight more books I believe okay um so at some point in the near future I hope to get them I know they made it into uh an anime but I can't really find anywhere Hmm. um or it's like it's on Amazon but it's not in your location like that kind of shit maybe Crunchyroll uh, I don't know if it's on Crunchyroll, but I don't have Crunchyroll, and mm. I'm not gonna pay for Crunchyroll to watch it. But uh, yeah, it's if you okay. want something anime esque, or if you're into manga and you're just like, I'm tired of the chosen hero story and mm-hmm. like energy blast and like <laughs> stuff that just doesn't make any sense, yeah. and you just want a simple, straightforward story of like adults dealing with adult things that isn't magical. At least as far as I know, maybe there's a magical element yeah. online, but so far it's just like a normal murder mystery story. It's pretty awesome okay well i actually have something very similar to that oh great uh it's called chained uh it was just on my list uh like eden like a list of movies to see don't know why it was on there but i said fuck it i watched it it's got vincent d'onofrio and he is a cab driver picks up women brings them back to his remote house and murders them uh he's a real bad dude so there is Husband, wife, and kid. The husband drops the wife and son off at the movies. And when they're leaving, they take a cab. It's Vincent D'Onofrio's. And he takes them back, kills the mom, leaves the kid in the car. And it's just like, hey, man, your mom's dead. She's never coming back. You're kind of my problem now. I'm not going to kill you, but you're going to kind of have to stay here. And he chains them to a real long chain and like, you're going to cook, you're going to clean, you're going to clean up after all the dead women that I bring home. Um, you're not going to try to escape or I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And you're just kind of stuck here. <clears throat> so he, and, and he does, he tries to escape one time going up in the attic, but he's got like cameras everywhere. And so flash forward 10 years, kid's been chained to this guy's uh, kitchen, sleeping on a little cot uh, he kind of looks like, uh, I think the character's name is Jasper from Twilight. You know, like the oh, skinny, yeah, yeah, yeah. pale, long blonde hair. Right, right. Um, he's in The Witcher. Uh, he's one of the, the, the bad guys. But I, 
I don't know the character's name of anybody in The Witcher. Right. Um, so Vincent D'Onofrio is like, eh. He had a fucked up. He had a real fucked up childhood where like his dad made him have sex with his mom because he, you know, his dad's like, oh, you're just, you're a little pussy. You need to actually have a woman and makes his wife sleep with her son. It's real gross. Uh, so, but then of course, like people who are abused sometimes repeat the same things to their own children. So he's like, you need your own woman and you, you, you know, sleep with her, kill her so you can get a taste for it. And this whole time, this kid, oh, he's called rabbit. Uh, that's the name he was, was given. Um, he doesn't want to do it and he's talking back and kind of growing some balls and he's like, no, you're, you're going to have to do this. And even like brings a high school yearbook and he's like, flip through the pages, pick the one you get to pick the girl and I'll go get her for you. And he doesn't want to do it, but he puts a knife in his hand and like makes them just like stab someone. And it's just some random girl that he gets. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to spoil this for you. Uh, not that that I I wasn't planning on watching it anyway. So he finds a girl and he's like, I'm going to leave you two alone. And rabbits just like, I don't want to do this. I've been here for, for 10 years and they kind of like bond real quickly. And so she's doing the, the thing of like, I'll let you do whatever you want to me. Just please don't kill me. Uh, you know, we could maybe get out of this together. And Vincent D'Onofrio is getting a little impatient, busts in, and he has the knife, and he, like, stabs her in the stomach. And then he's just like, get out of here! I want to do it in private! I'm like, okay. So then he drags her, they bury him in the basement. Well, oh, and then, and then after he's done, he's, like, covered in blood. He's like, I want to learn the hunt. So he takes him out and shows him the city, and like, oh, do you want that one? you want that one? You know, what's, what's, you know, you gotta have a good reason to want to kill these people. Uh, um, but it turns out he didn't actually kill her he stabbed her in a spot that he said he would miss all the proper organs because all he's been doing is just like reading these um anatomical books and the whole thing is it's just a trap to you know get out of there but Vincent D'Onofrio kind of finds out beats up rabbit and he goes to kill her and then they like cut his achilles tendon and um then one of the great things that I love that never happens, he has him like in a headlock with the knife to Vincent D'Onofrio's throat. And in most movies, it's like, you're not going to do that. And they, they chicken out and then they drop the knife, but he was just like, boop, right into his throat and just like killed him instantly. It was, it was great. <laughs> uh, and then he gets out, girl survives and yada, yada, yada. Should have been the end right there. Oh, and he goes back to the house at the very end. Like, I, this is all I've ever known. I'm going to just stay here. Should have been that, but they had to throw in a twist. So he goes and he finds his father. Oh yeah, and Vincent D'Onofrio has been showing him like newspaper clippings, like, oh look, see, they're looking for you, and oh, it's been six months. Uh, they're calling off the search, and nobody can find any evidence of where you are. And makes him keep a scrapbook of all the missing women. Uh, he finds his dad. His dad has remarried, has a, a new kid, and. He's just like, oh, my God, I, I can't believe it's you. It's been 10 years and, you know, don't even recognize you. But it must have happened, like, off screen. I don't remember him doing any of this. But he finds out that his dad and Vincent D'Onofrio are brothers. It was his uncle that kept him. And his dad paid his brother to kill his wife and son because he wanted to be done with them. But he didn't know he kept his son or his, you know, uh kept his nephew alive and so he confronts his dad on it and his dad like fights back but his new wife is like how dare you do that to your original family and um beats him over the head and kills him and then goes like rabbit get out of here i'm gonna say someone just broke in so it's like kind of an, <laughs> an interesting twist yeah but it came out of nowhere gotcha okay but I, you know not a bad movie like pretty good for low budget and it's it's really kind of horrifying when he's dragging in these women and how different they all react and some just like curl into a ball and cry some of them try to fight back and really great performances from all the the women victims that they genuinely looked horrified and scared is pretty awful but like a a well-made movie right well sounds like a bag of fun (laughs) yeah um, well, then, the last thing on my list, I watched uh, the entire first season of The Bear on Hulu. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't... I saw the trailer for this and initially didn't have, like, any real interest in it. Like, yeah. I, I don't need to see a cooking show. Uh, not a cooking show, but mm-hmm. a show set in a kitchen. Uh, it just didn't uh, didn't grab me. But then all I hear is just, like, great things. Mm-hmm. It's just, like, 
I all I hear is nothing but praise for the show, and everyone's talking about it. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll, it's only eight, eight episodes. Each episode averages like thirty minutes, and I was like, okay. oh, really? It's not even like a forty-four no, or hour. Well, the final episode's forty-eight minutes. Okay, but the episode before is twenty-one, and the rest oh. are like thirty. Huh. Oh. So yeah, average is like thirty minutes an episode, and uh, I, I see why the praise is there. I it's labeled as a comedy. It's not a comedy. Okay, like there's some there's funny moments. There's I, I definitely laughed out loud a couple times, uh, and I've seen it's like well it's more of a dramedy. It's like it, it's a drama that you laugh at mm-hmm. times. Like Lord of the Rings, you wouldn't consider a comedy, but no. there's jokes all oh, throughout yeah. it. Yeah, it, it's it's like that. It's uh, there's kind of funny characters and how they like yell at each other it, it can be uh, can make you laugh. But for the most part, this show gave me nothing but anxiety for eight episodes. Yeah, because it's all these people trying. It's so the premise of the story is this uh, guy comes back to run his brother's restaurant after his brother had killed himself, mm. and his uh, the, the this younger brother who now has uh, control over the restaurant, he was like this prodigy chef who like worked at the world's best restaurant in like France for a bunch of years Mm -hmm. and it's just like one of the greatest chefs out there and the restaurant he worked at it's a small cameo but uh, Joel McHale is the guy who like owns the French restaurant Okay, and he's a total fucking Joel McHale type where he's just like a total (laughs) asshole he's only in one scene for like a minute and he's just like going up to the main character just like why are you going so slow? Why are you such a piece of shit? Tell me you're a piece of shit. And he's like, I'm a piece of shit, chef. And it's just like that. Ugh. It's like that was your work environment in the best restaurant in the world. But so anyway, you have this ragtag group of like people who work at this small Chicago restaurant who just make sandwiches. And they're all just like yelling over each other and just like, move, I need hands. Fuck you. God, fuck you, man. And they're all just like yelling at each other. I'm just like, this is insane. And then you have like customers who are coming in and it's just it's all just a toxic work environment. But from the beginning of the show to the end, like, he does turn the place around. Like, people become better chefs. The back is cleaner. Like, they're constantly running into problems. They're, they're like, $300,000 in debt because his brother was an addict who was, like, borrowing mm. money from, like, gangsters and shit. And uh, it's, like, how is he going to, uh, like, make this place a functional business that is respectable and people treat each other well, and they can function as a team, and they all start getting there. But episode seven is probably one of the best episodes of television this year, oh. and it's right up my alley. I've talked about it on the show a bunch of times, but so the episode opens with like a title sequence, which the other episodes don't. And you're like, oh, that's weird because after watching six episodes, I'm like, have they done this before? Like, mm-hmm. I totally forgot about it. And then from the episode's 21 minutes, and from like two minutes and 30 seconds in. It's one long take. No Ooh. cuts whatsoever. And it's all just... Uh, no hidden cuts? Are there digital cuts? I was trying to look for digital cuts, and according to IMDb trivia, there's no edits. Cool. Um, I don't know if that's true. Maybe there is hidden cuts, but it's done so well, uh, and it's just... So the premise of this episode is they're switching to, like, they're able to take online orders, mm-hmm. and so they're just like, all right, we're going to get ready, we're going to go slow, we're going to start small... And they turn on the machine, and someone, like, let the pre-order option on. So now they have, like, 70 orders that are, like, due in, like, eight minutes. <laughs> and they haven't <laughs> anything. And so now it's just like this. Everyone is just, like, yelling at each other, and, like, the camera's going around. And it's all in this, like, really tight kitchen. And it's just, like, it. it's just, in a way, awful. But the fact that they've made this, like, a dynamic thing, and you're totally... It's it's amazing. It's, awesome. a, it's a great piece of television. Hmm. And then the final episode is also fantastic. But, uh, FX, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> FX knows how to do it. Uh, so I highly recommend it. It's I think it's great. It will make you frustrated that people work at a place where you're just constantly yelling at each other. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, like, like I said, the show did give me anxiety. I don't think it's a particularly funny show, but there is funny moments, and there are characters who you're just like, I hate that person. But by the end, you kind of, like, grow to like them a little okay. bit because, like, yeah, he's a fucking douchebag, but he does love this person mm-hmm. or she's like so mean because that like for no reason but it's just like that's just her defense mechanism and then she's like oh i can learn to be nice kind of thing cool so it's like you grow to like the characters and there's like the lovable uh, not the lovable of but like the big guy who's like 
really wants to make pastries and donuts mm-hmm. and he's like looking <laughs> in like donut shop windows he was like ooh that looks good like there's there's likable things and it got a season two and I, I'm I'm into it I'm okay. looking for season two now I it seems like this has been getting a lot of buzz lately being on Hulu but I thought I saw commercials for this when Dave was on was this on FX I I don't know enough about the okay. backstory I just know that it popped up on Hulu and I was like eh whatever yeah. and then once everyone started talking about it, I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. Mm. So I don't so I don't know. Because yeah. um, it seems like maybe it went on air, tanked horribly, but they realized th- this is something. And let's put it on Hulu as if, I mean, most F- FX things go on Hulu, but let's really promote it to because people should be watching. Because I've heard nothing but good things about this. But I swore I saw stuff about it a year ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my big thing with this is just I, I hate when... And award shows don't matter. Mm-hmm. But one of my biggest pet peeves at award shows is when it's like best uh, best comedy category, and then it's like Better Call Saul or yeah. something that's in like I know that's not the, Better Call Saul's not in the comedy category, yeah. but it's like something that has a couple jokes, but it's just like a prestige drama mm-hmm. hidden as a comedy. You're like you just get put into here so it can like win awards. Yeah. it's not but good it's not enough to be show. the drama winner. But we it's like The Martian. Yeah. was best comedy or musical. It was neither of those things. What, yeah. what was it doing there? I think, what was the, not Salt, what was the jo- Johnny Depp, Angelina Jolie? Oh, uh, The Tourist? The Tourist. That yeah. was like nominated for best comedy or musical. I'm like, this is yeah, like a like, spy thriller. Yeah, just because a movie isn't bleak doesn't make it a dramatic comedy. Yeah. It, it, it makes no sense. Or, yeah, um, or, or have, have tears. Like, this is Best Picture A and Best Picture B. Like, this is the top of the line stuff, and this is really good stuff, like, say, Mad Max Fury Road. You know, like, we don't want to give it the real award because it's not real yeah. cinema. It, it's the most enjoyable drama yeah. versus the the drama that'll, like, make you cry yeah. or, like, be angry or whatever. The the, the one with the, the great acting and then the one you had a good, good time with. Yeah. Right? Uh, but I, it has great acting, and I had a good time with it, and uh, had some great filmmaking aspects to it, uh, and really surprised cameos with Joel McHale, and oh, his brother who killed himself is John Barenthal. He only pops oh. in for one scene in the entire <laughs> show. But it's like I, every time he comes in, I'm like, this guy is in fucking everything. Yeah, I see John Barenthal in like every other thing I watch somehow. Uh, who was I? I was talking to someone about like how great to be an actor when they say you just just come in. And, oh, I was talking to Nick about The Fall. And uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan played, like, one of the girls' mom. Uh, <laughs> yes, he, he played the mom. Uh, he played one of the, the dads and only has, like, a few phone phone calls with the person. Mm-hmm. And, like, how great to be able to get a paycheck just to spend a day on set talking on a phone. Yeah, you, you show up in, like, a promo because they're like, oh, he's in this show. Yeah. And it's like you give the show a little bit of credit mm-hmm. and like acting chops, but really you're just you're there. just there for a minute. Yeah, just there for a minute. God, I wonder how much Joel McHale got paid. Like, I know there's acting standards and there's something like regardless of yeah, amount yeah, of time, yeah, yeah. it's it's a twenty thousand dollar, two hundred thousand, whatever it is. I, I'd like to. I want to see actors' paychecks. They they don't talk about money enough, and I get why they don't. But I would love, and I like like there's so many podcasts now where comedians and smaller actors just talk bullshit about like the system yeah. and and other actors and i and i have been seeing it more like oh yeah i did this thing and you know it made me fifty thousand dollars i was there for a day i i want to see brad pitt talk about you know how much did he get paid for deadpool 2 just doing that little well they, that, d- they have talked about oh did they it. yeah he didn't get paid anything he, oh okay it was, he did it as a favor to ryan reynolds uh, he brian reynolds uh, bought him a coffee. That was, the, that was <laughs> okay. The okay, costume. but there are a lot of those sort of uh, scenes in movies yeah, where yeah, it's yeah. like, okay, you had to get paid. Not everybody's doing favors here. Mm-hmm. Or uh, was Matt Damon a favor as well for Deadpool two? Because he's at the very beginning as like the redneck. Oh yeah, but I mean, he did have speaking lines. That's true. Yeah, that's so true. He he got paid something. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I saw a new movie. Okay, tell me about it. It was in theaters and. On Paramount Plus, oh. it's The Orphan First Kill. Okay. Did you see The Orphan? I did not. Oh. I I was surprised. Like, when it came out, I didn't know the twist would be the twist. And uh-huh. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Um, but I just had no real interest in it. Okay. Well, the twist 
makes it pretty cool. Yeah. It's good. I'm not going to say it because I was talking to Nick earlier, and he's like, oh, I never saw it. I'm like, oh, but you know the twist, right? He's like, nope, don't know what, know, know what it is. So I'm, this is for you, Nick. I'm not spoiling it. He, he was telling me how he was listening to our last episode, and he's just like, fuck, I want to see that. And <laughs> having to skip, skip forward and stuff. Uh, so Orphan 2. It's a prequel. Okay. And... I'm not going to spoil this movie, really. Okay. Because there's, there's nothing, there is one thing to spoil, but kind of the main story is if you don't know the story of the, the first movie, uh, it's hard to talk about this. So, right. Nick, maybe, maybe just fast forward. But she's in an insane asylum, breaks out, and finds a family who lost their daughter like six years ago or something. And it's like, oh. I could slide right in. And so she pretends to be this this kid and the mom and the brother are a little wary of her and just like, hmm, there's something something off here, but the dad has fallen head over heels. He got his little girl back. Go ahead. Well, I would so does I I can't remember, this is just me guessing, but I wanna say that the original orphan was what, twenty ten? Uh, around there, yeah. Does she still look? If this is a prequel, they they use the same. That she was like eleven when she filmed the first one. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, she's not like a real. No, I, 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 I know, <laughs> but I just thought she would, was like fourteen, fifteen. No, playing. she was eleven, and then so they had to like age her up at the end of that movie to you know put a little makeup to make her look sure. 30s or whatever and in this one she's like a 30 year old now or 25 whatever makeup on and, and to make her younger and they're doing like deep fake technology to make her look younger they're using putting her face on a little girl's body okay. so it it looks pretty good okay, like, okay. you you do believe it um you know fuck it, i'm gonna just spoil it for you <laughs> Yep. I mean, we kind of already talked about yeah. the twist. So, so well, the, the real twist is this uh, girl that has gone missing, she's not missing. The, the brother killed her on accident when they were little. They were horse playing, and she, like, whacked her head. And the mom saw it and said, well, I don't want to ruin my son's life because of this one thing. So they hid her body and just have pretended for all these years that their daughter is just missing. So then this girl shows up and goes, oh, I'm your long-lost daughter. And they're like what the fuck? No, you're dead. There's no way you could possibly be it. So she eventually like confronts her and it's like, look, this is your life. Now you're going to pretend to be my daughter. Otherwise I'm going to out you. Oh, and she like kills this cop and you're like, other, you know, I'm going to frame you for this, this killing and you're going to get sent back to your mental facility. And so the, the last half of the movie is a little bit of a cat and mouse of them trying to like fuck each other over, but keep the dad in the dark. So it's a little silly. It's a little stupid, but it's a, it's a pretty good prequel. Except for the title. It's called Orphan First Kill. It's not her first kill. She's in the sanitarium, and they talk about when she killed this other family when she was trying to uh, pose as their daughter. So this is not the first kill. This, is, this could be her 20th kill. I don't know why they named that, and but I wouldn't be surprised if we get a prequel to this prequel and see that story because it seemed pretty interesting. But it's on Paramount Plus, Orphan 2. Check it out. All right. Uh, you're done though, right? I'm all done. Okay. Uh, play the game, Little Nightmares. It's fun. Only like a two hour game. It's not long at all. It looked reminiscent of like Inside. Inside Limbo. Limbo. It's yeah. all those. It has a, like yes, especially with how it's always a little kid in a dark, spooky, nightmarish world. They're, they're mm-hmm. very similar. It has a little bit more uh, control. Like you have your, your crouch, which makes you like sneak you can run you can slide you can grab and pull and push things and then you also have a lighter and that's like your only source of light at times i thought it would come into play more but it really doesn't uh it's fun uh kind of kind of hard at times okay of like figuring out what the a lot of the puzzles are super easy but there are parts where oh i found a little secret room and i'm in there and i'm like what am i supposed to do in here and it's just a save point room like oh i lit a lantern and you're done and i'm like trying to do everything and you you're if you jump onto a crate you have to jump and then hit grab in order to grab it and pull yourself up so sometimes i forget that and you you go to like jump and swing from a lamp and you don't hit the grab and then you fall to your death uh but i like a lot of the the, the visuals, the monsters are horrifying. The sounds they make, and it's a weird 
butcher shop on a ship that is for a restaurant. It, it's and, and I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're a real small person in a normal world or you're a normal sized person in a really big world. <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to say because like sometimes you'll see seagulls and the seagulls will be equivalent to your size. Um, but then other things seem like, well, though that's way too big. Uh, I'm not sure. It's all very vague. No yeah, dialogue. I mean, maybe that's part of the nightmare scenario. Sure. It's not, it's, yeah. You know, but it is nonsensical. pretty gross. And I died a lot. There are these chefs that chase you and grab you. And I, I was just getting my ass handed a bunch of times. But it, it's a fun game. I, I would is recommend it. Is there any it. dialogue? No dialogue. No, no, okay. Yep. Right. And uh, would you say it's. Because you played all of Inside and Limbo. Correct? I did not play Limbo. Okay, I, I played Limbo. like a half hour of Limbo, but oh. I never beat it. I was going to say, would you consider it harder? But, um, but like you said, it, well, with Inside, I don't remember having to like Google a lot. There was only one but puzzle. Like Limbo, uh, there was like a puzzle or two. I was like, I don't know what the fuck. No, there, there was some of these where you... you you look around and sometimes it's like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to see or something's chasing you. You run into a room and it's dead end. And like, where the fuck do I go? Oh, I'm supposed to go in that crate. I didn't even notice that I can get into that crate. Right, right, right. So it was little things like that. Uh, inside had one puzzle that I just couldn't figure out, but this one had quite a few. And I was just okay. like, what am I doing? Uh, I, mean, at least with, I think the nice thing about Inside is that everything was like lit. Where mm-hmm. like Limbo was so black and white. Sometimes yeah. it was like you can't tell the difference between like a shadow and mm-hmm. like something that was like physically there. Yeah. So I imagine Little Nightmares is like that in between. Yeah. I'd say the only issue is sometimes you're up in rafters or on pipes and you go through a door and then the camera will shift and you're, you know, you're pushing right to walk and then the camera shifts and then you walk right off. Right, right, right. Um, there's no, you know, little wobble before you fall to catch yourself, you just walk straight off. And so a lot of times I was finding myself crouching and walking just to take things slow. And it's a slow crouch walk. And and that could be a little frustrating. And there are a lot of trial and error where you're just, you run into a room and it's like, shit, I don't know what to do. Oh crap. There's this big thing chasing me. I guess I'll keep running. And I didn't say anything. Fuck. I'm dead. Okay. Let me try it again. And you do it again and again. And then, oh, 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 there's a lever back there. I didn't notice that. So it got a little repetitive at times. But the aesthetic is really great. I, I, I would say it's like Coraline, especially because the little yellow raincoat. Mm-hmm. Coraline meets Mad God. Like, it's a good, happy okay. happy medium. It's horrific visuals, but not to the extreme as, as Mad God is. But, you know, it's a free game, so. Yeah. yeah. I'll probably play it uh, after, uh, I'm in, in a little bit. I, yeah. I don't know. Um, but it's definitely on my to play list. All right. Well, let's move on tonight, Steve. You and I both got some. We we got hot D. Oh, we got hot D all up in our face. As we're, and uh, that acronym is Game of Thrones House of the Dragon. Uh, I I love a good acronym. Mm-hmm. Whenever like like you know Lord of the Rings, that you some like Guardians of the Galaxy, you see them and you know exactly what it is. But if you put up like got hot D, I wouldn't know what that is. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, first episode, new Game of Thrones spinoff, uh, 178 years before Daenerys was born. Uh, they made sure to emphasize that right at the beginning. Like, she's not going to show up in a cameo. All you, uh, the, We got plenty of white-haired people for you, though. Uh, everybody looks like they're from The Witcher. Uh, <laughs> everybody looks like evil elves, uh, especially Matt Smith. Uh, he just looks like he should have pointy ears. Uh, he's like in the wrong show. He should be in like one of the crappy Hobbit movies. He just looks like an elf. But uh, besides all that, uh, what do you think? Uh, so I, I will say this was this despite we're not going to go into season eight, um, but despite all the the backlash of season eight and anticipation for like oh. Uh, because at one point there was like three shows in the works that's mm-hmm. all set in the Game of Thrones universe, and I'm just like, uh, who, and they canceled who, the good one. Who cares? Yeah, I mean, I was looking forward to the first, the man, first man, if yeah. that's the title of it, because that just sounded cool. Yeah. But uh, I understand why why they went this route, and uh, I I thought it was a a pretty great first episode. Um, I'm a big fan of like, especially when you see a world and you see like. Oh, this only like this was important two hundred years ago, mm-hmm. but you never really saw its importance. And this episode opens in Heron Hall when it's all when it's in all of its glory. Like this was the unbreachable castle that mm-hmm. you could throw a hundred thousand men at, and like no one could bring it down. But what brought it down? 
dragons, dragons yeah. but we don't see that yet. Um, you think we'll get a flashback to that? I hope that's... I need to brush up on my Dance of Dragons Targaryen lore, but if this is... I could see that being sort of like the final battle of... I, I, I don't know. I imagine we'll get a Heron Hall destruction sequence at some point. Um, but who knows? Um, and we see... Uh, what was it called? Not... Uh, where they store all the dragons, you know, that big dome yeah. place. We saw the outside of it, mm-hmm. um, but we didn't see what's inside. But like, I can't imagine. Like, can you imagine walking into a building and there's just like sixteen dragons <laughs> hanging, hanging out? out. Like, uh, m- I love that line from Peter Dinklage where he's just like, "I must. I imagine this must have been the most terrifying place in the world. Mm-hmm. I want to see the most terrifying place yeah. in the world." I think we get hints of it in uh, the trailers we've seen of just like fire and like a dark corridor or whatever. Yeah. It's like I want to see the inside of this place mm-hmm. and the fact that we see workers who just have like long sticks to yeah. like wrangle dragons like <laughs> what What are you doing like that seems like a, the worst that seems like the worst job on the planet unless you're getting paid like a million gold, gold pesos, pay. whatever the fuck they yeah uh, gold crowns gold crowns yes yeah. that it, there wouldn't be enough money in the world it's like imagine being the crocodile hunter but the crocodiles are a thousand times larger yeah and uh, when one of the dragons <laughs> thinking like i know you're the person in charge of putting me in my pen but what are you going to do with that stick yeah. I've breathed fire. I'm yeah. huge. My meals are bigger than you. What are you going to do <laughs> with a stick? And, you know, it's like we have people who, like, wrangle elephants sure. and all that stuff. But, like, sure. those are docile creatures. Like, elephants are, like, big old dogs, essentially. Yeah. Um, Did you know elephants think we're cute? I bet. Yeah, they think we're just like, mean, like how we look at dogs and cats and go, look how cute they are. They look at us and think they're yeah. we're cute. Like, that makes sense. But... All these things are like killer killing machines. Yeah. Uh, that I don't think really care for any hu- human life other than <laughs> the dragon riders by some innate magic that yeah. their bloodline has. Yeah. Um, but it's a smell. <laughs> uh, but the Targaryens smell a certain way. Yeah, that was another thing. It was just there was a joke. I guess it was a joke in the beginning of the episode. Which was just like, you should go take a bath. You smell like dragon. I wonder mm-hmm. what dragons smell like. Yeah. Because clearly it's, like, not a great smell, but mm-hmm. also I imagine because, like, they work with fire. Is it just, like, you smell kind of like a... You've been near a bonfire lately? Because, like, like, their scales are kind of slime. I, I don't see them as, like, slimy no, or anything, but... but I've been around where people have, like, iguanas and snakes in a cage. And, mm-hmm. like, the, the cages yeah. smell, but is that because they are trapped in it? Like, if you picked up a snake in the wild and sniffed it, would it smell the same way or would it just kind of smell like dirt because yeah been slithering and dirt exactly yeah All right, next episode we're gonna go find some snakes and we're gonna smell them <laughs> we're gonna smell wild snakes uh, <laughs> what did you consume the 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 scent of a snake yeah but in terms of you know the episode uh perfectly well acted um you definitely get a sense of like who the characters are and how they are as people uh you get tons of references to like other houses you get little glimpses of you know, the Lord of Winterfell, the Starks, mm-hmm. and the Baratheons, and they mention the Tarleys. So they mention, like, all these names you've heard yeah. before, but all these houses that will be, like, inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, yeah. at, at least for, for now. Um, and it's all just Targaryen politics, and we get a glimpse of two new dragons? Yes. Uh, Yellow and a red. Yeah, we see Prince Damon's. Uh, also, I, I know this because I watched some of the behind the scenes. Known as the Blood Worm, and he's kind of like this wild. That's its name or its type. Uh, no, his name. They, I think they say his name. It's like Maraxis or something. Mm. Um, but he's known as the Blood Worm, and he's got this like really long neck, and he looks really terrifying. Yeah. Um, and then you have Princess Reyna's. Princess Tia Beanie. <laughs> Princess Tia Beanie. Yeah. Uh, her, we see her dragon. It's a yellow dragon. Uh, Which I, I like that one. Yeah. It's more smooth, looks more calm, but also still terrifying. Still a big dragon. Still a big, scary dragon. And uh, yeah, I mean, visual effects, great. Acting, great. Uh, clearly, they spent a ton of money on the show. It's like, look at this pilot episode versus the pilot episode of Game of Thrones. Sure. You're like, this is not even in the same world. Yeah. In terms of like production value. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know. But look at most shows. When, but, yeah, when yeah. yeah. I mean, if you one, look at season eight of Game of Thrones and you look at this, be like, okay, yeah. this is the same world. Yeah. Um, I like that they made the Iron Throne more of like how it's kind of depicted. Like I, I wish 
I want that that concept art. Yeah, I want the concept art one for sure. Because all those ones sticking out from the ground, that looks stupid. (laughs) It looked real dumb. I don't know if it looks stupid. Like I think it does. Like you walk into a room and you see a bunch of like blades sticking on the floor. It's like, oh, that's pretty menacing. But from a person who like lives there, it'd be like, no, just get rid of these. They're just taking up space. If I trip and fall, like if Mm -hmm. I'm walking down these steps and I slip the wrong way, like I'm gonna slice my throat open. Like it's a it's a it's a uh, not an HR nightmare. I don't know. Someone kind of would kind of have to contact OSHA or something. Yeah, because it's, it's an OSHA nightmare. Yeah, yeah. it's an OSHA nightmare. Yeah. Uh, but but. Uh, it it'd be one thing if it they all ended up like that because of some crazy battle, but it's not. They were purposely put there, and they're just randomly stuck in weird spots. If they made some sort of fanning pattern, something, but it's just like, eh, one sticking up there, one sticking up there. It's not even if double the amount maybe it would look cooler but i just thought it looked like shit i mean it's not my favorite design but it was fine for me it didn't bother me that much uh and uh, i mean it's definitely a game of thrones show sure uh you get a gratuitous orgy scene mm-hmm, essentially mm-hmm. plenty of there's plenty of nudity uh you get some very graphic violence in like this tournament that they throw um there's a bloody birthing scene that's just ugh awful uh, <laughs> both of us are like shielding our eyes the whole time yeah uh you know people's arms wrist deep in another person and just, <laughs> just awful uh but like i said ultimately all together i think it's a really great pilot episode i look forward to the rest of the season i look forward to see- seeing uh dragons in all their glory like just mm-hmm. mowing down armies because uh, I feel like we've gotten a lot of movies with dragons, but we've never seen them be used so viciously in combat. It's always like, oh, they'll swoop down and like, yeah, you Daenerys know, came in and did one fire, fire thing and then like and the battles over really quick. Yeah. I, I think Game of Thrones has done it better than any other uh, before. So I look forward to see it. like, but that was just essentially. Yeah, there were three dragons, but it was pretty much always Drogon mm-hmm. that was like the star of the show. Yep. Like I'm looking forward. They've confirmed there's going to be nine dragons this season. Okay. I think there's. They said there's 16 dragons in the world left, but we're going to see nine of them. Okay. In the first season, uh, so I want to see nine dragons just going like all out. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe we'll only see one or two do some crazy shit. And we'll but, have dragon versus dragon because the the prince is going to be all pissed off that he's not the heir anymore. Uh, and he has his own dragon, mm-hmm. and so then uh, he'll definitely be using it against his, his family's dragon, so that'll be fun. Yeah. And uh, the only part I don't know if I liked, because it just seemed like, oh, hey, remember that? Th-? And it's like, yeah, you're bringing up house names, but those house names have been around. Like, bringing up the Starks and the Baratheons and all that kind of stuff, it didn't bother me. The last minute of this episode, essentially, was, hey... Just so you know, now that you're going to be the heir to the throne, you got to watch out for the White Walkers. They're going to come. And, ju- and it's like this kind of like long... Did they? Yeah, we remember it's just like... It, they never said White Walkers. But it's like, look, there's going to be a threat. It's going to come from the north. You need to be prepared. It's going to be called the Song of Ice and Fire. It was just uh, like... You don't remember that speech at the end? Yeah, but I didn't think of White Walkers because I th- thought in Game of Thrones we hadn't seen them in hundreds upon hundreds of years so i didn't even assume they would be in the show oh god i hope they're not in this show Why no, no no they're not gonna be in the show because they don't come back until game of thrones it's yeah. just it was weird that like it ended the episode of just like hey by the way this is a thing that the kings need to know that there's a prophecy that mm-hmm. the great winter's gonna come from the north and it's not gonna be up for the to a targaryen to defeat them mm-hmm. and all this stuff it's just like so it, it just made it seem like this was going to be the thing they're going to have to deal with, mm-hmm. but Wait, none, of them, that, wasn't none of them going to have to deal with it. <laughs> in the coming this season, was, was that actually in the episode, or was it? Yeah. In, oh wow. Okay. Well. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I, I you just spaced out. I guess so. Um, I didn't care for this. Oh yeah. Looks nice. Uh, sets, costumes, special effects. Uh, I. Don't, I mean, we. I think we knew from the get go it's going to be a technical. Yeah. And costume achievement for sure. Uh, Cast, I don't like anybody. I I like, uh, what's his name? Reese Mm Ephons. I've always liked him. the hand of the king? Yeah, Yeah. I like him, and I I think I like him the best in the show. 
but I don't like any of these actors for any of these roles. I don't like looking at any of their faces. They're all weird looking. I did not connect with any of them like I did with Game of Thrones. Like you instantly connect with with all the Starks. Like you just like all of them right from the get go, and you uh, just like I, the the world. I can't fall in love with because I've already been there and there's nothing new and different except now mm-hmm. there's more dragons and it just feels like it's not far back enough. I don't care about this time period. I don't care about the Targaryens, especially since it hasn't been that long since we've seen them. Uh, I was hoping this would really blow me away and sell me on it. I'm not. I was kind of bored. Uh, I'm going to go meh. Okay. If 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 I wasn't allowed to watch the rest of this, I'd be fine. Yeah, I mean, I think, and there's a problem with fantasy a lot of times, like jumping into a series, and it's like you got to remember a lot of names, and no one's name is easy except for <laughs> yeah. the hand of the king, whose name is Otto. Uh-huh. Uh, so there's you have no to, Brian's or Chris's in <laughs> yeah. this, you know. Uh, so you got to remember all these names and all and these they, places. And they reunit use names all the time. Uh, like there, it's or at least the, yeah, yeah. Uh, similar sounding yeah, names, yeah, yeah. and then it's like, oh well, that person was from this family later on, but now we're using this name for this family, and it's like, God, get get be a little more original. And I get it; it makes sense, but yeah. uh, I mean, I think the show does a good enough job to so you can follow who's who and all that. Like it, it's sure. not it's not hard to follow, no. but if fantasy isn't your thing, or like this is your, you didn't watch any of Game of Thrones, and this is like your first jump into yeah. uh, the George R. R. Martin world. Mm-hmm. Michael, like, what the f- fuck is this? It's yeah. like, the dragons look cool. Yeah. Like, I can see this not being for everyone. Um, yeah, if you didn't watch Game of Thrones, there's no reason for you to watch this, because why would this convince you if you never bothered with that? Mm-hmm. And if you have never watched Game of Thrones, there's no point in going back and watching Game of Thrones Uh so I feel like this is only for the the fan base, but so many of them have been were burned by the the last series. The the, the it's got to be a small group of people who are really itching for this because either you're turned off and and you don't give a shit, or okay, I guess I'll give it a try, or you've never seen it before. So and so why would you jump in now? I cannot see this show ever doing numbers like the original series did, and will never be as interesting. Um, I'm going to be a big sourpuss on this one. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, don't think it'll, I don't think it'll put up Game of Thrones numbers, but I think, yeah, that part of that is the, you know, how that show ended and the bad blood and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be an uphill battle to, like, reach those numbers, mm-hmm. But it does have the benefit of being like they know how all these characters and they know that it's the completed story and maybe they can do some like really grand spectacle stuff because clearly they're throwing a bunch of money mm-hmm. at it. Um, but I I don't I think you're underestimating the interest in it in terms of just like, oh, it's for a small niche group of like fans yeah. who just like Game of Thrones. Like I think I I think it has potential to be big just not but it certainly won't be uh game of thrones big Mm -hmm. um or at least if it got game of thrones big it'll take some time uh i will say i do agree with you in terms of characters it's like jumping in the first episode of game of thrones you liked Tyrion, you Mm -hmm. liked the starks because the starks even though they were like the rich royal uh rich noble family Mm -hmm. they were kind of like you're every man it's like you knew from the get-go oh these are your heroes Mm -hmm. where like You know from Game of Thrones, the Targaryens are like, oh, well, there's the Mad King. And, you know, Daenerys goes mad. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, these people have dragons. And they're like, it's like if the uh, royal family of England, like, had dragons. It's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, are they good people? Do we care about them? And it's like, or are we only supposed to like them because they're the royal family? Mm -hmm. It's like if they didn't have dragons, which they said in this episode, like we would just be normal people if we Mm -hmm. didn't have dragons. Yeah, Uh, We're just sitting on living nuclear bombs (laughs) at all times. But uh, that first season of original Game of Thrones, like you love Robert Baratheon, you hate Cersei, like everybody is so clearly defined and, and fleshed out just in the few minutes that you see some of these people. And I got none of that from this. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, we're only one episode in. Yep. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see, like, what other characters come in. If there will be lighthearted characters. It, will it be... Well, be Game of Thrones was more of a fun show where this is more of a, like... We're only focusing on, like, five characters where Game of Thrones cast was, like, massive. Yeah. It would be smart of them to pare it down a yeah, bit. Yeah, Because this is just the Targaryen story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I could, I could see that complaint is like, will it not be fun? And maybe it's like the idea is, well, maybe it's not going to be as fun, but that's Mm -hmm. why we have dragons. So we'll see. But yeah, but when you don't have a Tyrion, like he really added so much to that show comedy and just great monologues and smart strategies Mm -hmm. without a character like that. uh, I don't know. Yeah. I think this show will be a lot of girl power um and sticking it to the to the man and that's not a complaint by any means mm-hmm. but when you're like it's too woke <laughs> fuck game of no, thrones that's not where that's not where i'm going it's like when it's like people want to call us and that's like the only thing they can see it's like if like what made Jon snow fun was like yeah he was kind of a bummer mm-hmm. but like he uh it was the fact that he didn't want to do any of this shit. Mm-hmm. Like, he didn't want to go beyond the wall and infiltrate the group. He didn't mm-hmm. want to, like, run the Night's Watch. Yeah. He didn't want to become the King of the North. He yeah. didn't want to become... He just wanted to be a he celibate just, guard, you yeah, know? He just wanted to do an honorable job. Yeah. And he just kept getting thrust in these shitty situations. So it's like, yeah, he wasn't, like, a fun, cheery character. He was always mm-hmm. dark and brooding and wasn't always cracking jokes. But, like, he was fun to watch because he was, like, making the best out of bad situations yeah. where it's like, oh, here's all these people vying for power. It's like, do we care about them having power? Uh, we'll see. Mm-hmm. How many seasons do you think this is going to go? Because it's only one book, but like you said, it was uh, it's one guy telling the story, so a lot of it can be uh, you know shortened, and they really can stretch things out. I can't see it, you know three three seasons. Yeah, I Maybe would say five. I would say three. You could probably tell the whole story, and I'm not an expert on. Uh, the Targaryen lore at this time, like many people are and will be after this episode, because uh-huh. everyone's going to be like, well, let me look up every YouTube video that explains <laughs> the history of the Targaryen family yes. so I can go to parties and be like, well, actually, actually no. No. Uh, <laughs> But I would say that three, maybe five max, because uh, I don't see this being an eight, ten season show by any mm-hmm. means, which is fine. You, know, like you do your three or whatever, and then if you still want to make Game of Thrones shows, do the first men or do whatever those spinoffs or maybe just go all right we had our time we'll not do this there's a uh i think a pretty popular uh, song of ice and fire well it's not song of ice and fire but set in the same world of game of thrones of like dunk and egg you know these two guys one's like a knight and one might be like a king or something and they're just like they're wacky adventures it <laughs> kind of seems like a and i don't know enough about this but it kind of seems like kind of like this com- comical adventure of these two hmm. doofuses or okay. whatever uh, maybe do something with that but yeah I, I i don't i don't know okay. and we'll uh we'll see but i'm gonna say my my pitch is for three seasons and then be done i i just kind of wish they released this like season three of game of thrones ends mm-hmm. we get this spinoff so then they could have them both running at the same time to wait so long to spin it off into something, especially after the poor reception of the final two seasons. I mean, it's been, what, three years? It hasn't been, like, a super long time since No, but it, it. it would have been in production a long time ago, and it would have been even closer to the end of that. I just feel it would have been smarter to have a spinoff, you know, as the show's going, and then by the time Game of Thrones is done, you have that other thing that people are already you know psyched for and then you bring your your second spinoff it just seems like uh, it's a little little too late yeah i mean unless it's like oh well game of thrones is what we loved here's this other show that we don't care about as much because we're so invested in game of thrones oh this show ended so poorly i don't want to watch the other show because if it's going to do the same thing or it's like maybe it could work maybe it wouldn't maybe they just I... hamper each other maybe hbo didn't want to spend 200 million dollars every year on two shows uh I, I think they're fine. Um, but they're like, look at Walking Dead. You know, they had Fear of the Walking Dead with, it was, I think, by season s- four? Mm-hmm. I think by season four, they had Fear of the Walking Dead come out. And now that Walking Dead's done, well, now they have 
Tales of the Walking Dead that will also be out with Fear. So they, they'll, they'll, have, they'll be able to keep that world going and not relying on, hey, remember Walking Dead? Well, here's a new show. It's like, well, we were already done with that a couple of years ago. Now you want us to get back into it? So if there was a little bit of an overlap with the release, I think it would have been better, especially if they would have done that first one of, of the first men and the children of the forest. That, that would have been really interesting to, to go back, say, you know, our prequel is something that happened at the way, 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 way beginning. And then by the time the show's done, if people are still hyped for Targaryen and dragon stuff, well, here we go. Here's your your crazy dragon show. But for the people who like really love the history of this world, here's this other show. Mm-hmm. But I, I, mean, I don't run I HBO. agree. I'd much rather see the... Uh, the first men show, mm-hmm. but this is what we got, so this is what I'm working with here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in terms of The Walking Dead, uh, none of those shows are good, and uh, they're <laughs> all much cheaper and easier to make than Game of Thrones and for House sure. of Dragons. For sure. So it's like, especially I, the trailer for this last season looked like a parody of what Walking Dead. Like it just looks so cheap, mm. uh, in my opinion. Mm. I and you're allowed to like things, and if you like Walking <laughs> Dead, great. But I just don't think that show has ever been particularly that good. And I think it looks really bad now. Okay. Okay. Um, and I was looking forward to The Walking Dead being over so you would stop talking to me about no, it. No, never. And it's like, but we now have, you've been talking to me about Fear the Walking Dead for years. And now there's this Tales from the Walking Dead, yep, which I yep. hope crashes and burns. But <laughs> probably not because what else does AMC have? I mean, have? it is only six episodes, but since it's an anthology thing, they'll definitely bring it back because it's easy in between season sort of stuff. But then we're going to get the Rick and Michonne show. Oh, we're going to yeah. get the, the Negan. Um, what's her fucking name? Maggie. The Negan Maggie show. Uh, we're supposed to get well, I heard about the Rick Daryl and... Carroll. Wait, they're... Hang on. <laughs> I I heard about the Rick and Michonne thing, and that makes sense because they were like, we promised three Rick movies, Uh which but then they were canceled. (laughs) But they were canceled, so it's like here's a show to wrap that up, Mm -hmm. which is fine. I can get behind that. But that that that's confirmed that there's a Negan show and a Daryl Carroll show. It was a couple of months ago they announced it. It was going to be called Isle of the Dead, and I think it was it takes place in Manhattan. I hate this country and uh, what? That's, a go- <laughs> that's a great idea of i mean i don't care about negan and maggie because i know they're gonna make them fuck even though they're supposed to well they they've settled their beef you mm-hmm. know it's been years they've settled it there there's still animosity but it's for the most part settled but i know because they've now settled it they're gonna be in crazy situations where it's just like you know i just gotta feel something different right now and, blah, 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 and then they're just gonna start making out and it's gonna be awful uh but like isle of the dead and have it manhattan you know it's not a tropical island it's it's a, a cityscape and you 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 block off the bridges and no one can get in it's you could have this major big community uh, without too much of a fear of invaders i think that's a that's a fun idea yeah but i no, i, I can get behind the idea i have a problem with it being the walking dead and with <laughs> like with these other characters like if you want to do a, a, a zombie show kyle called isle of the dead and it takes place in manhattan cool do that but do it with other characters not from the walking dead universe and not, and don't make a walking dead uh the, the point is, uh, I, don't, I don't care about The Walking Dead. Read the books. The books are great. Fuck that show. All right. Anything else about Game of, Game of Thrones? Do you want to make yeah, your predictions? Yeah, we went on a change about Walking Dead. Uh, like, when's the king going to die? At the end of the season? End of the season. I, I think it's going to happen early because we're going to have to get the, you know, we don't want you on. Even though she's named the successor, she's not on the throne yet. So, yeah, that's going to piss people off. But is it really going to rally the armies? Well, I, I know that they're going to jump forward in time to when mm-hmm. they're a little bit older. Um, oh, yeah. So maybe we'll jump forward in time and we don't know how he dies. She's on the throne and then that will be well, a big no, miss her, yeah, mystery. I, I, don't know if she, I don't know if she'll be on the throne by the... I think he could still be around. It'll be like he's old. He's on his deathbed. Like mm-hmm. they're, Everyone's like, that's where the conflict's coming. It's like he's days away from death. It's like when he dies, it's going to be all out war for this throne. Um, so maybe he sticks around to the end of the season. Mm. That's that's my prediction. Or he dies, you know, next episode, and then it's just back and forth to when he's alive yeah. and after he's dead. And yeah, yeah she's on the throne. But uh, I hope she puts a pillow down. Like, but uh, not- I mean, it's been has, wasn't it 
confirmed from Game of Thrones that no woman had ever taken the seat oh, of the Iron Throne. That's so I true. think like so she he has to stay alive. So he has to stay alive, and or I, or he could die, but even maybe people close to the king is keeping her yeah. away, and she has to go and, on the yeah, run. Damon could be like on the Iron Throne, but she's fighting to get her thing. I yeah, I'm not. I forget the lore. I need to brush up. Uh, I just watch some YouTube videos like everyone else and become an expert. I have the book. I just need to really read the book. <laughs> oh, you haven't finished it or no, never no, started no. it? No, I, I started it. And the, the first chapter is so interesting because uh, the first chapter is just talks about how Aegon, the, the Conqueror, came on Balerion the Dread, the largest dragon. Mm-hmm. That big skull we saw? The big skull we okay. saw, yeah. Just, uh, I believe that was his dragon. Um, and just came in and like, conquered Westeros, but like couldn't conquer Dorne because they were like, in the desert and mm-hmm. like the armies couldn't travel there and it's like yeah the dragons could like fly long distances but they didn't need... it was like a whole big like there was logistical reasons why the dragons couldn't conquer yeah. door and i was like oh that's so interesting and cool mm-hmm. and how they like slowed down their armies it's like him conquering westeros with like i think his two sisters who were also dragon riders and like the one dragon rider was like who Arya identified with in like mm. the first season of game of thrones like that whole conquering of westeros like that sounds like a cool fucking show mm-hmm. um, as well. But yeah, I I got that far. It's like, oh, this is really good. And then I got stuck reading another book and yeah. I just never went back to it. So, but now that this show's out, once I get done my current book, maybe I'll, you know. You won't wait till the end of the show and then read it so you don't like spoil yourself or? No, no, I, I don't mind. And well, that's the other thing because this book is done and it's, they say it's written from the perspective of a maester who like is just right who wrote down the history it's like the show has the opportunity to tell like the real truth like they can alter things if they mm-hmm. want to from the book uh oh, and yeah. just like do the grand strokes because there is theories in the game of thrones universe of like the maesters aren't like impartial beings like mm-hmm. they try and influence sure things and They'll rewrite history if it makes other people yeah. yada yada yada. So you could do like even though the book is written and done, that's and a there's gr- facts that you can still way change to... things if you want to on the show. We were talking earlier about how like Lord of the Rings, there are going to be people who are upset because they they change some characters, they add you know a black person somewhere, you know they they get like uh, they change some stuff and people are going to be super pissed. Where well, like well this. In in uh, unreliable narrator, mm-hmm. you you can just do whatever you want. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice workaround for the base of a TV show. Yeah. But from a book perspective, you're just like, uh, well, this well they did this, and it's like, uh, well, shut the fuck up because uh, we could do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah. Because well, that guy wasn't there, and this is what actually happened. So in your face. Well, you don't like it, don't watch it. But guess what? You're gonna watch it, and those numbers are gonna make us a bunch of money. So mm-hmm. thanks, dweeb. <laughs> All right, we done with oh, that. God, we're like four hours in. We haven't even gotten to Better Call Saul. Well, oh. speaking of great shows and prequels, Better Call oh, Saul. They're, they're much better than last week's segue. Yep. Uh, yeah. One of the probably... How many great prequels are there really? Uh, I don't know how good Many Saints of Newark is. I don't know if that was a good Sopranos <laughs> prequel. Uh, the fact that I've... Never heard anyone talk about that movie. No, it came uh, and went. Came and went. Uh, uh, and it came, what, 15 years? I don't know. I don't know when uh, The Sopranos ended. 2008? Mm, I didn't watch now. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have our, our, our Hobbits. Not very good. Uh, the Star Wars prequels. Not very good. I mean, Prey was technically a prequel, but yeah. that's not, like, too connecting uh, with the this, this series, so I wouldn't We're really... We're talking about things that were considered one of the greatest things of all time. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, well, let's do another thing. It's like, well, you can't top it. Yeah. Or can you? Or can you? And this <laughs> proves if you have the right creative team, you know, the original creative team, you can make something even better. Well, I will say not just the original team, the original team who's passionate about it. Yes. Because it's like, I feel like... <laughs> yeah, George Lucas... You yeah. know, <laughs> you you go okay. Well, we, we want to make a prequel because it's popular. It makes tons of money or whatever. It's like, and then you hire outside people to do it because mm-hmm. the original people are like, well, we don't want to tarnish our legacy, and those other people are like, fuck it up. Yeah. Or like, oh well, we brought in James Cameron as a producer, so mm-hmm. you know it's gonna be good. Because but it's like, I'm just here for the paycheck, man. Yeah. And they don't care about it, so no. they are they're not really. They might give some notes, but ultimately, it's not really essential. Um, let me. Let me... Before we go on, I want to Google. Great prequels? Great prequels. Okay. I want to see what comes up. Let's look at that. 
All right, so here's some some prequels. Uh, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly, which I don't think really counts because the the, what the it's called the Dollars trilogy. Yep. Uh, the man with no name. Even though he has a name, I think uh, they're not really connected. Like all these actors are in the other movies playing different, and they're about money, but they're not really a- absolutely connected. Cruella. Okay. okay. Yeah, good, good prequel. No one, I think, no one but us loved it. Uh, but <laughs> I, I think in the long, long run, it'll become definitely a, a cult favorite. I don't know if it'll be a cult favorite, but I think people go like, you know what, actually, wasn't that bad? Cruella. Yeah. Escape the Planet of the Apes. Uh, I don't think any of the Planet of the Apes movies are good past the first one. Oh, uh, well, I mean, if you want to count the uh, Matt Reeves, no, they're their own thing. I mean, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Bumblebee. Bumblebee is so much better than Transformers, so yeah. Yeah, but... Ooh, no. Oz the Great and Powerful? No! <laughs> no! Like, Sam Raimi's worst, James Franco's worst. That's a... It's a bad movie. It's been so long, I can't comment on it. Uh, I have seen it, and I think I remember going like, okay, that was fine, but... Yeah. I mean, it has Star Wars episode, Revenge of the Sith. Okay, Rogue One. No. I know, I'm in the minority. It's not a good movie. It's a it's a pretty good war movie, and it's a good looking Star Wars movie, but it's a real bad story. Uh, oh, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I mean, worse Indiana Jones movie, but it is technically a prequel. You like Kingdom of Crystal Skull over Temple of Doom? Oh shit! I forgot that even existed. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I'm sorry. Second worst, but did, did you see that Tarantino said Crystal Skull is better than Last Crusade? I, I didn't look into the comments on like why he said that, but Tarantino is a big fan of Crystal, Crystal Skull apparently, and not so much Last Crusade, which Last Crusade is is the best Indiana Jones fantastic. movie. Oh my god! Shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, oh, it's got Alien Covenant. No, that's bad. Okay, The Thing, more of a remake, but it is a prequel. But it's just the sure. same movie. Same movie uh, that got ruined by the studio. Okay, Wonder Woman is not a prequel. It is just a standalone movie. X-Men First Class. Yep. That's probably one of the better ones. Yep. Okay. Scorpion King. Uh, Monsters <laughs> University. I like Monsters University more than Monsters, Inc. I think I'm in the minority there. There's just a charm about it that I really, really liked. Puss in Boots. Didn't see. Twin Peaks. Firewalk with me. Didn't see. Fast Five. Fast Five? Oh, yeah. well, Fast Five is a prequel in the sense that Tokyo Drift takes place after Fast Five or whatever because Han is in it. Yeah, and I guess. I guess. Don't, don't worry about that. No. Uh, I feel like a lot of the, this list is just movies that were good but weren't like great. Yeah, it's like yeah, here's this thing that was great, and then we made a decent prequel. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't a bad prequel, which isn't what we're looking for. I'm no. looking for. Great, prequels. great prequels, and I think we only have one, and it's Better Call Saul. It's. If you guys think oh. of great prequels, yeah, let us know in the comments. Let, tell I'm, us. I'm spacing right now, thinking of them. I love this show so much. It was it every Monday. I when the weekend was over, I was excited to get the week started because when <laughs> I got home from work, I got to watch Better Call Saul. This show had me at the edge of my seat every episode, even when it's. It's not always guns and explosion sort of tension. Sometimes it's just doing a small con, slipping something somewhere where that's not supposed to be, taking a picture of something uh, to frame someone. It, it, it just, or like in one of the final episodes, a dude slips in a mall and, the, and, it's, and it's like played for laughs. And it's also so intense. High, so intense that you're just like, oh my God, I, Wake How, up, wake up, wake, wake up, up, get, up. Go, go, go do it. But then it also allows him to like uh, unload all this trauma that he's experienced and mm-hmm. and like say truthful things. And it, it just juggles all these things at, at, at one time. And, and no show is as funny and as uh, uh, intense as Better Call Saul. Now, we talked about early in the podcast of like dramedies. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a show that rides a line of like, it's kind of a dramedy. Yeah. And yeah, I can get behind that argument. Sure. But it's just the best drama on mm-hmm. television. I wouldn't say it's the best dramedy on television. It's just the best made show. And, and it's so funny. It's have funny moments. Yeah, because Bob Odenkirk is just one of... It doesn't matter what he's saying. 
he's just funny. And when he's angry and yelling at someone, he just has this great voice that there is a bit of, of of uh, just silliness to him mm-hmm. that it, it, he's just so perfect for this character. And obviously he made this character his own. It's not like, uh, like on paper, I'm sure it was similar, but without Bob Odenkirk, like, can you imagine if like David Cross was Saul Goodman? I, it wouldn't work uh, <laughs> at, at all. Uh, I'm really upset that David Cross never cameoed. In yeah. The but, show, but though. what would he be? I, okay. Actually I could see him being a fellow teacher with Walt, you know, just like doing the humdrum uh, oh. mundane stuff, being okay. in the teacher's lounge and just having a dumb coffee mug with a carpe diem on it. Uh, it just be really low key. Or like I think he should have been um, a, that secretary who like he would give like a stuffed animal to oh, in yeah. the office and just like oh hey Carol how sure. you doing and, just, and she's just like kind of like over dealing with the stuff. lawyer that if he, helps him in the end yeah, yeah if that could have been just, him like some guy who's like annoyed by Saul mm-hmm. I think that would have been a good character who's just like shows up for like three episodes yeah. just for like a quick scene here and there but it would have been so distracting because uh, yeah, if it, you know who these people are it, it would be like okay now I'm watching a, a bit I'm watching a sketch so I think if, if David Cross were to ever show up he can't be in the same scene with uh, Bob Odenkirk yeah I guess he could be a rival lawyer he sh- or he could have been at the Misa Verde stuff with sure. Kim or whatever yeah um, Kim's ex that would have been funny oh. <laughs> that would have been really funny uh, but I, okay, so let's let's take a step back. Okay. Um, when you heard that they were making a prequel show mm-hmm. to arguably the greatest show ever made, yeah. what was your initial thought? I was like, don't. Please don't. God. Yeah. Especially we, when you heard it was a show about Saul Goodman. Yes. I, I, I felt it was going to tarnish the original show. And, and they did say, like, their initial thoughts were it would be more of a half-hour show comedy Mm -hmm. where each episode would be a different case and look at all the wacky silly things and it would be much lower stakes and i think if that's what it was i i would have been like okay there's no chance that this is gonna ruin um breaking bad because it is such a different show and and we're seeing a different part but knowing that it's going to be this like real dramatic thing that scared me more because like oh they're gonna take this too serious and they're going to ruin it but uh nah they did not yeah i was in the same boat where it's like oh i heard they're doing a comedy spinoff with bob odenkirk and better call Saul or the saul goodman show whatever it was and i was just like i just don't care it's like how do you because it's so rare for a show not only to be so good but get better every season and then land the ending because yeah. the ending of a show is so hard mm-hmm. and so few shows have done it so well that you're like it it's the best episode the show has mm-hmm. made now i know ozzy mandis is like the best episode of uh, breaking bad and yeah the fina- but like the finale is a perfect finale in my mm-hmm. opinion it's like so it ended perfectly everyone got either come up and sort of like drove off in the sunset and you know eventually we got el camino which also excellent yeah uh but it's like I can't believe that they were able to pull off what they pulled off mm-hmm. with a character who was essentially just like there for comedic relief in a few scenes yeah. here and there. He's supposed to only be in a few episodes, but he's just so damn good. And it's really a testament to the writing where like honestly, every single one of the characters in this show could have their own spin off show oh, yeah. and I would watch it. Yeah. And I'm sure it would be great. Mm-hmm. Uh but because I was like, I when the sh- they announced the Saul stuff, I was just like, no, what? Give me the Gus and Mike sh- yeah. like show. Like that's the that's the spinoff show I want to see. And then but we they, got it. But, but we got it. We yeah. got it in this. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And I, I, I boy, will, howdy. I will say, <laughs> the Mike and Guff, Guff. <laughs> the Mike and Gus Super Lab stuff. That that's the name of the show. Mike and Gus Super Lab <laughs> stuff. Uh, is it's a fun cartoon comedy. Uh, huh? Yeah, I think it's the worst stuff in better call Saul. Okay. But it's still better than most anything out there. Every time they would cut to that, like, I don't care how the super lab was built. I know it is. I don't care about Werner Ziegler and, and his problems, but they make it so compelling that you, you do get invested. And that's only, I think it, in a rewatch, mm. I'll be kind of like, eh, let's get through this. But because we got Mike in this, we learned so much more about him. Like we knew he was a cop in, in Philly, or maybe we didn't even know he was in Philly, but I think like we knew he was a cop in breaking bad, yep. but we didn't know 
the stuff about his son and what he did to to become corrupt. And uh, I'm I'm so happy that this wasn't just the Saul Goodman show. We got it was the Mike Ehrman Trout show as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember watching the first season and. Like, I couldn't tell you much about the first season. I can't tell you much about a lot of this show. Like, mm-hmm. I remember certain moments and everything. Sure. But I believe it was the first season. When it, the episode, I think, was called 5 okay. And it was the Mike's origin story episode. Mm-hmm. And we see all that stuff. Is that in season one? I believe it's... It might be season two. Let me, okay. Let me uh, look it up here. Pull up the old IMDb. Oh, no. Thank God for IMDb. Like, yeah, let, let's just lay out every episode. and. Yeah, episode six of season one was 5 Wow. And... Uh, I love that episode. Yeah. I love Mike's backstory. I love that, you know, because we always see Mike as like this hardened dude, mm-hmm. but seeing him like sit on a couch and like crying because he's like, I basically killed my son. Yeah. Even though like he didn't pull the trigger. No. He, like he wasn't even, he wasn't there when his son was murdered, but mm-hmm. he's like, I'm the reason. I convinced my son to take the bribe and yeah. they killed him two days later. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, just great acting from, uh, oh God, what's his name? Uh, Mike Garman Trout. Sure. That's, that's his name. Uh, but yeah, I think once that episode aired, I was like, okay, this show is on to something. Mm-hmm. And from then on, I was I was sold. It took six episodes to really sell me, but sure. I'm like, this is this is good stuff. I, I think there's an episode before. I think it's episode four where we see Jimmy. When he was still kind of doing slipping, slipping Jimmy stuff, he we see flashbacks to his friend who would help him with some of his cons. He'd pass out in a in a alleyway and wear a fake Rolex, and they would, you know, anytime Jimmy was doing a con is great. But this is because we knew he was a scumbag criminal lawyer, but we didn't really know anything about him. And to make him a slip and fall type of con man is just genius, mm-hmm. and and it just adds so much to his his intelligence on everything because he always has a way always has a scheme that can help him get through something yeah it's really the and I, maybe this is and i'm sure smart people have made this comparison before where they talk about the it's the antithesis to walter white where it's like walter white was book smart he could get out of these crazy situations because he knew science and mm-hmm. chemistry like i can make the the little ball of crystal stuff that I can yeah. throw on the ground and it'll explode and get mm-hmm. me out of the Tuco situation or I can use magnets yeah. to like destroy evidence <laughs> uh-huh. where it's like Jimmy didn't have that what Jimmy had was street smarts so mm-hmm. he could outsmart anyone he was the smartest guy in the room street smart wise he was never smarter than Walter White uh, IQ wise but he could probably trick Walter White into doing some shit yeah. <laughs> if he really wanted to or make Walter White believe and stuff like Slippin' Jimmy is a, a genius and but he's played as like the dumbest guy. Yeah, he 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 comes off like a clown wearing yeah. his crazy suits, and oh, he only helps criminals because he is a criminal. And like, no, he is a really really good lawyer, and he yeah. knows the law and and how to manipulate it to to get through things. And they just they I think a lot of people just underestimate him, but time and time again, he just shows how good he is at everything he does. Yeah, I I think that's something that more people need to. Re- it's like. It's that's that's a sort of, that's a very smart survival strategy is like look dumber or weaker than you are mm-hmm. so you can actually like so your enemies will underestimate you kind yeah. of thing and Walter White always everyone knew he was smart mm-hmm. he always appeared intimidating once he shaved his head and was yeah. like I'm the one who knocks like Jimmy never had that he couldn't mm-hmm. go up to any of the like gangsters or tough guys it's like as soon as anyone like threatened him at all he was just like oh god oh god like yeah. don't hurt me like he <laughs> didn't have a backup why. plan he'll give up he, he just had yeah. to talk his way out of stuff yeah. and he was so good at it yeah like the second episode is you know he has those two twins try to you know smash into Betsy Kettleman's car but it's Tuco's grandmother mm-hmm. and he gets away to he talks his way out of Tuco killing him and then he could easily just walk away but he comes back and talks him down from like a death he calls it like I talked talk you out of a death sentence to like six months probation because he you know they just broke his legs mm-hmm. and and just like that's how good he is this this guy wanted to murder three people and bury him in the desert and they all walked out alive amazing mm-hmm. well, a great gift of, of gab uh, so, do you want to go down characters and maybe yeah, favorite? Yeah, I, I think we should talk about characters introduced in this show. 
Okay. And we got to talk about our second lead. I mean, some people would say Mike is the second lead. Not true. Second lead, Ray Seahorn. Woo! Kim Wexler, one of the greatest characters ever. Like, Jimmy is amazing. No one else comes close except for him. Even even in Breaking Bad, I love Jesse. I love Walt. I like Kim better. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'd watch so much more of her. And in, in, in doing a rewatch like I'm on episode four, she's barely in these first few episodes. She has very small parts. It, it was interesting because I, I, she's so integral to later plots. It was interesting seeing her just in one scene or two scenes, three lines of dialogue. Uh, but Ray Seahorn, I didn't know anything about this actress except for she was on... Uh, the Whitney Cumming show. Oh, really? Yeah, she was like her, her I, friend. I, don't I still don't think I've ever seen anything else that she's been in. That, yeah, this is the only thing I've seen her in. And like thinking back, I mean, that show was really cringy. Whitney Cummings is not my favorite comedian, but for some reason my aunt really liked it. I think she okay. thought it was like, ooh, this is edgy, but not so edgy that she's grossed out. So, mm-hmm. she, you know, it's cool to watch. Right, right. It's kind of like my parents like love Big Bang Theory because it's like they have the their finger on the pulse of nerd culture. And it's like, <laughs> that's, that's not it at all. But yeah, I remember her being on it and, you know, nothing special, nothing bad. But sure. it, uh, but then when I saw her on this show, I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's her. Oh, okay, well, let's see how she does. And she kills it. She is. Yeah, every season she gets better and better and better. more. And, like, I have said on this podcast many times, I am a Skylar White defender. Mm-hmm. I think she was a phenomenal actress and she was integral to the show. And all yeah. the hate that she got, undeserved. She was so important to that show. And, yeah. I, and I love Anna Gunn and... Uh, Skylar White. I, I feel like a fool because I was one person who was like, fuck you, Skylar. Just let Walt do his cool ass shit. Yeah. And, and it's, that's it's like I think that's what makes uh Kim Wexler such an interesting character is that while Skylar White was constantly going, Don't do that, stop doing this, which any normal person yeah, would yeah. and She's understandable. A- it's just like here's Kim going like, yeah. I'll, I'll join you. Yeah, I'll do and it. just like was just in the game uh-huh. because it made her life exciting, and it she wasn't a bummer. Mm-mm. She had her own thing going on. Like at she wasn't happy with Jimmy doing this Jimmy stuff, but she was just like, "Look, you do your thing, I'll do mine, and mm-hmm. we'll come home and we'll be a couple because we love each other, yep. and we'll make that work." And then when that kind of fizzled out, it's like, "Okay, well, oh, we're gonna stick it to Howard." I fucking hate that guy. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. Let's do some Jimmy shit. And then she was like all in on the game until and, and later he, on when it got too big. And and even he was God. like, we need to pull back. We need to stop. And she's like, no, no, no. Yeah. We are doing this. She was more of an instigator than he was. He uh-huh. he was uh, the, the what's the, the phrase? Uh, instigator? No, the sound of reason. The uh, Oh, yeah, the, the voice of reason. The voice of reason, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was the voice of reason, and she's just like, nah, we can do more. We can get more. And I, I think that's the the quality of a, a, a great con man, is a con mm-hmm. man knows when to bail. Yeah. A, a great one does. It's like, because if this, it's not worth going to jail or getting our legs broken <laughs> if this doesn't work. Like, let's pull back. And it's just like, no, no, we need to keep going. Yeah. Because this is our only chance. This is our only, only chance. only opportunity yeah, yeah. it'll happen. Um, so yeah. I'm glad that that's the, that's, what Jimmy was good at. It's like, if this isn't going to work, then we're not going to do it. And, and they the were really part. good season by season. Cause a lot of the times it was just, let's pretend we're siblings at a bar. We've won some money and let's con some person. And they may go through the con most of the way, but then they don't pull the trigger and steal the person's money or ruin mm-hmm. their lives. It was just kind of a, this is a fun flirty thing that we can do, but then every season it gets a little more and a little more and a little more. And, and there is that seesaw of her, her justification of like doing these fucked up things to bad people, but then giving back by doing f- pro bono uh, lawyer work for people who really need it. And so she's constantly going back and forth of, well, I'm doing all this good. It's okay if I do some of this bad because mm-hmm. these people deserve the good and these people deserve the bad. Yeah. It's like legal gray area of like somewhat vigilantism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and another thing I like about, I, I love a good con story cause it's always fun to see like underdogs or whatever, or, like pull off kind of like small stakes heist. It's not always yeah. about like, it's not Ocean's 100. Eleven. Yeah, it's not Ocean's Eleven. Like Ocean's Eleven are fun movies because the characters yeah. are fun, but it's always like they pull off, or they like they'll show you the plan for the heist. Yeah. And the plan doesn't go as planned, and then the heist is just over. It's like, oh, 
How did we do it? And then it flashes back and yeah. shows all this. Always. I love thing. that Breaking Bad will show you the like you know what he's doing at every step of the way. Mm-hmm. At least I think almost every in every scenario is like you see the plan, you know why he's doing what he's doing. Or even if you don't, it's kind of like explain the moment, you're like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. And if something happens, like, oh, he's adjusting the plan in real time, and it's never just you never see the plan. Like, you never just see him walk out with a suitcase and, like, well, how did he get the suitcase? And it's like, oh, well, he did this, this, and this. Yeah. It's like, well, I, it would have been nice to see all that. Yeah. And you, I, I'm glad that it was like you saw all of it beginning to end. Uh, yeah. And, it, it really plays out where, like, we're going to do a thing. And then, because in movies, you go, here's the plan. They tell the plan and they show how it's supposed to work perfectly. Something always goes wrong. So then they have to adjust. Or it's a, all right, here we're, we're going to do it. And then if they don't show you the the plan, well, then it's going to like go off without a hitch. This, they just say, we have a plan and just come with the journey with us. Mm-hmm. And you've, especially their big final one, you're not 100% how they're trying to fuck over Howard. But then you get little, little things of like the hooker, the drugs, and you think, oh, it's just like ruining his career. But then it's, oh, it is about the Sandpiper case and how to make him unreliable. And and you learn a little more and a little more. And, and as you're, because I was so confused that like, how is this private eye? Like, how are they going to work around that? But it was Jimmy's private eye the whole time. And you don't know that until like the last moment. And they're so good with their, their reveals. And, and anytime there's a con, like there could have been no Mike, no Gus, no jumping forward to Saul Goodman and it could have just been Jimmy and Kim do cons every week and I would have been for it because all their stuff is so much fun Mm -hmm. yeah and I think the fact that it was like kind of not small stakes like it was big things they were doing but it wasn't like I think I'm if it was like a heist show where they are trying to get like a hundred million dollars out of a safe mm-hmm. or like sneak into the museum to steal the glass Faberge egg <laughs> yeah. or whatever. It's like, I don't, I, I wouldn't ultimately care about that kind of stuff. Cause it just seems like, Oh, well this is just rich people spending a bunch of money to pull off heist to get like more money. Mm-hmm. Or just like, Oh no, I'm just doing a bunch of like gags to make a guy look like an asshole. Uh-huh. I think that's a lot more fun. Yeah. Uh, and it's like they did a little bit of that in, in Breaking Bad. A lot of Walt doing science stuff. Oh, I'm going to put the squeegee on the guy's battery so it blows up his engine. It, they're really good at – or Mike making – a taking the hose and turning it into a spike strip or putting a balloon up to blow up uh, or the hit the power lines. And it's like little funny gags that are just, wow. Genius. So mm-hmm. so simple, so inventive. These people are the best at what they do. <laughs> uh, so any, well, I mean, we'll get to Kim Wexler and final thoughts in the last sure. season and all that stuff. But it's like any other favorite Kim moments or things you like about the character yes. throughout the seasons? I love that her and Jimmy are smokers. You okay. don't see people smoking on TV and in movies anymore. It's kind of just like a... a a fad that has gone away. Yeah, there are people still smoke in real life, but there have been like rules about movie and TV ratings when people are smoking. Like a, a movie, like say uh, X Men Origins Wolverine. Okay, <laughs> he never has a lit cigar. If he, they would have lit that cigar, it would have become a rated R movie. They had all these little weird rules. I don't know how much they are in effect now, but so he just chomps on it. PG thirteen. He's not really smoking. It's fine. So a lot of movies and shows they just. Nobody smokes, Mm -hmm. you know, or or they vape, you know, but I like that Kim and Jimmy smoke. It it was just a a, it was a nice bonding thing that 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 they had together, because I don't think like Jimmy ever really smokes on his own. Only with Kim. But Kim is a smoker. I think she's good about not smoking all the time. But when she needs one, she has one. And and then it, it was a it was our first introduction to them in the very first episode of Jimmy trying to, you know, get uh, Howard to. Uh, uh, what's his Chuck try to yeah. get Chuck out, out of HHM doesn't go well goes into the parking garage and they have a nice little moment and they share a cigarette yeah, and that gets mirrored at, on in the final episode and it was just heartbreaking <laughs> and I think uh, people forget when the show takes place like this show takes place in like 2007 or 8 because like no well I mean maybe I think it's a few years but I think it's 2000 whatever it's around that time but two sure i want to say 2002 yeah. was the first episode. um but i'm pretty sure and i could be wrong 2002 you could still like smoke in like certain restaurants, restaurants and, and stuff, stuff. Yeah. And it's like smoking was still a relatively 
big thing yeah. and stuff. It, like I don't even know if like the uh, the truth programs had come out at the time or like they were relatively <laughs> Maybe, new. Yeah. It's like so, and especially people of their age, like smoking would have been part of yeah, their lexicon from you know the seventies or eighties whenever I, they were born. I would have been twenty one, and you know on my twenty first birthday, I was in a bar, and you can smoke in that bar. Yeah. I, I I remember it was I think it was twenty one or twenty two. I actually had to like leave a bar because there was way too many people smoking in it. It was just too much. And as a smoker at, at the yeah. time, it was even much for me. Yeah, uh, and I mean. Smoking is not necessarily integral to their characters, but it is a character trait of theirs, and it it's, makes sense for the time. It's so it's like, like she has yeah, a, nice, it, a bad habit. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Anything, and, anything else? Anything uh, for you? With Kim, uh, just a character that really grew on I me. Mean, not that I disliked her from the beginning or anything like that. I, I I've always liked her, but just it's not. It's cool to see a character who like starts off as just like uh, a not a foil for Saul and just like oh just oh she's the female character of the show yeah and he's, then she's the girlfriend the girlfriend yeah. yeah and then grow and grow into a more dynamic character and given more and more intense scenes and well just what a powerhouse performance and I hope she wins an award for this final yeah. season I don't think she will it'll be someone from succession Breaking Breaking Bad has a problem with uh or well, not Breaking Bad um but it doesn't matter. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and I want to segue into the, the next character, uh, Michael McKean, as uh, Chuck, mm -hmm. Jimmy's brother, who has a, a, a mental disorder where he has a, a electromagnetism. He's allergic to, to electricity. He was never nominated for any of the big awards, and he is phenomenal, yeah. especially in, in Chicanery, which is like considered one of the best episodes of Better Call Saul. It's the season three mm -hmm. where brother versus brother in a courtroom fighting with, with the law. And then, you know, Michael McKean trying to do things by the book and Jimmy doing his little con thing to, to show his brother yeah, being I think, a fraud. Uh, Chicanery is this show's Ozymandias. Yeah. Um, just because it's, it's weird to come so early in the show because it has three more seasons after yeah, this, and yeah. I think season six is the best season of the show just because it's, like, all payoff. All payoff. And it's all fantastic because yeah. it's, like, it's all been building, essentially, from season one to season six. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, Chicanery is the crux of, I think, it's when, you know, Jimmy and Saul, like, it's, it's really the the birth of Saul Goodman. Mm -hmm. Like, Saul and Jimmy and Gene, and they were always all kind of there, this amalgamation of a man who's trying to figure out who he is. But, yeah, just, oh, that courtroom scene is some of the best television. And Michael McKean is great. I'm glad he didn't he didn't continue. I think that, yeah. you know, once he, it's kind of like once Michael McKean died, or Chuck died, he was off the leash, and it was mm -hmm. just all cons and slipping jimmy and i think that's when the show really got a lot of fun mm -hmm. but the dynamic between saul and chuck or jimmy and chuck is just beautiful stuff because you don't really you see a lot of family members who like dislike each other and stuff mm -hmm. in media but it's rare you see like but you ultimately like usually in film and television it's like the family they might hate each other but they come together at the end mm -hmm. but this is just like no you're a piece of shit yeah. and I kind of fucking hate you mm -hmm. and you've been a burden on my life and I wish I hadn't known you and this is like one brother who just wants the other one to love him and mm -hmm. just like can't get it because he can't not be a piece of shit yeah. and ultimately like ends up killing his brother. Uh-huh. And and uh, indirectly but indirectly. also directly. <laughs> there, there's a, a flashback to when like the McGill's mother dies mm -hmm. and Michael McKean's there you know, Jimmy went to go get a sandwich or something. He, he couldn't be bothered to hang hang around. And the only thing that their mom says is, where's Jimmy? Where's Jimmy? And, and mm -hmm. for him, it's like, this guy is just not worth your effort. But on in your last words are calling out for the guy who can't even be here to hear your last words. And that just really like stuck with him. And all through the years, he was constantly bailing out his brother and then all of a sudden he wants to become a lawyer as well and, and realize the, realizing the implications of this this con man. You know, he says it, you know, Saul, uh, Jimmy McGill with a, a law degree is like a chimp with a machine gun. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just totally re resented everything because Jimmy didn't follow the law and constantly got away with things and was a criminal. And, you know, Chuck was a great lawyer who's completely all about the law. 
Yeah, it's a it's a that that final shot of I think it's the end of season three when he's kicking and you don't know why he's kicking and then you see the lantern fall over, cut to the outside, and you just see it light up inside. What what a brutal way to go. Yeah, and, what a, like I can get behind killing yourself, but like killing yeah. yourself to death with like fire is that's that's brutal. brutal. Yeah. I mean I I think they did say like, oh the smoke made him pass out or sure, it's but like you you'll die from the breathing in the smoke before the, the fire. The fire but still. was right at his feet though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oof, boof. Uh yeah, what a what a great way to top off the first half of your show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh so Michael McKean great actor yeah. who I pretty much only know from the Clue film I think is he in Clue I yeah. I, I know him from he like Spinal Mr. Tap I think he was Mr. Green really I mean he was real young in it there we go <laughs> let me let me pull I mean he's an actor who I think I've seen other stuff in like smaller roles but he was never like a breakout guy I mean he's in tons of stuff but he was I, real huge in the 80s and stuff right Oh, he was in Spinal Tap. Yeah, Spinal Tap is the. But yeah, he was. Oh, yeah, it was Mr. Green. Yeah, it was Mr. Green. So okay. I knew him most as Mr. Okay. Green and Clue. Also, great film. Watch Clue if eh. you haven't. I mean, I haven't seen it since I was like eighteen. You're not a fan of Clue? I don't like Clue. No. Oh wow. Yeah, I love the game. I love the board game, <laughs> but the movie I, I didn't care for. Okay. Uh, I think our last new character main character that was introduced for this show we got a lot of little characters throughout but uh nacho mm-hmm. ignacio varga varga yeah yeah man what a what a lucky dude to get a role like this because i didn't see him in anything before this nope. and and now he has such a unique face you identify him instantly yeah i bet he's the nicest guy in the world but yeah. he looks menacing <laughs> yeah he, especially on this show yeah and in in this that this first season where he's kind of jimmy's big bad mm-hmm. and then seeing where he goes and he is just like low on the totem pole for all these other even worse people and all he wants to do is get out save his dad get rid of the salamancas or and just try to survive himself uh but the one, one of oh, actually no, we still have Howard too to talk about. Sure. Um, but like one of two people who got a real bum deal at the end. Yeah, if there's uh, like a Jesse Penguin equivalent, uh-huh. it's kind of uh, Nacho, because um, he's your. But he's not like a. He's not a. He's like if Jesse was better at his job and yeah. wasn't a junkie. Yeah, and wasn't like a doofus. Like mm-hmm. he's very smart and capable. Yeah. As we've seen him like dig himself out of like really bad situations. Uh, like submerge himself in yeah, rancid he's just, oil. He's just yeah. like your lovable character in the in the drug game mm-hmm. that we follow. And that was kind of just. You know, he's doing bad stuff, but you see his love for his dad. And then you see how much his dad is disappointed in his son because his dad's very a very righteous person of, no, you do things the right way. You go to the cops and, and doesn't see the world for what it is. And Nacho just being so torn of trying to protect his father but having these duties to these horribly evil people Mm -hmm. and you know i I always try it when i'm watching a show it's like oh here's a character who like deals drugs and works for the cartel but he loves his dad and Mm -hmm. it was just like i love nacho so much i hope good things it's like yeah you you root for the guy to you root for him to get out Mm -hmm. but by no means am i sitting here going like Nacho's a great guy. Yeah, no, he's I mean, not. He's not. He, like you, he goes back to his house and he has like two addicted women who just live there, and they're just like you know his quote unquote girlfriends or whatever. But they're only really hanging out for the free drugs and, and a place to live. It's like you root for him because he shouldn't be there, but yeah. he has put himself in the situation. Not like they abducted him. It's mm-hmm. like you're gonna work for the cartel now. It's yeah. just like he just thought it was a good way to make money, and mm-hmm. now he's like, shit, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Uh, but anywho, yeah. Great performance. Uh, favorite Nacho moments. Um, the putting the pills in Hector Salamanca's. Yeah. Teach, like learning how to like drop them into the coat. Uh-huh. And that's what what I love about the show so much is they take something of, okay, well, how do I get these pills in his coat without him noticing? In most shows, you would just he would just put them in, swap them. It would be two seconds. It would be nothing. But we spend time of him learning how to like get the walk down and to mm-hmm. toss it in properly. And they're, they're so good with taking these mundane, simple things and just really making it interesting to watch right uh that was one of the most intense moments of the show uh the pill sequence and mm-hmm. it's like you knew it would work. and i love that that's the origin of 
Yeah, uh, Hector Salamanca in the yes. chair. Because you never know in Breaking Bad how he got in there. Mm-mm. You just assume you just, like, he's he an old guy. Old and yeah. then he was in there, but it's like, no, someone put him in that chair. Mm-hmm. And oh, his final speech in season six, where yeah. he's just like, I want you to know it was me. It was the, it was the, um, Game of Thrones, tell Cersei was me. Moment, yes. But it's like, <laughs> I'm the one who put you in that chair. It's like, I know I'm going to die, so fuck you. Yeah. And just like, and when you're sitting there, what a way to go slurping out. Slurping down your jello, I want you to know it was me. He gets like so growly and so <laughs> scary. It was very much a Christian Bale Batman voice. <laughs> yeah. Swear to me, old man. <laughs> and I like all the stuff with him. And uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Mark Porks. Uh, he's in what we do with in the shadows, uh, the the show. He's Colin Robinson. He was on the oh, office. Oh, the, yeah, the goofy guy. He, the goofy guy like, who I need my baseball card. Back. <laughs> yes, yeah. driving the the big uh, Hummer. Uh, what's yeah. he called? It's like looks like the pussy wagon. No, no, the, it's like Tarantino. like an eight year old pimp. Uh, it's like it looks like an eight year old pimped out a school bus or something <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah, all of his interactions w- with him, and I don't know if you caught it. And maybe we talked about it, but when uh, Jimmy is talking to Francesca about like, oh, what about the money here? What about the money there? And she's saying it's all gone. It's all gone. Well, that character, uh, the the Hummer guy, the baseball card guy, he eventually ran the the laser tag place that he was using to mo- launder money. Oh, really? So that that's what he ended up doing. That's so, funny. That's kind of fun. And, oh, well, we didn't even talk about it. I can't believe they made this fantastic dynamic. Interesting character from a throwaway line. Yeah. From they're just like, who who was coming after me? Was it Nacho? Yeah. It was a throwaway line in Breaking Bad. And uh-huh. it's like, there was no backstory to Nacho. There. No. It was like, just a name. It was just a name. And they were like, no what? Let's take that name and create a whole character. That, that's like, what that's we crazy. we really gotta applaud them for really looking at what happened in Breaking Bad and saying what should we do to not contradict any of this? We don't have to always reference everything and not mm-hmm. everything has to be a callback, but like uh, Saul Goodman says that he was like married twice at one point. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh crap. Well, we can say he got married to Kim and that's one and they, they'll eventually break up. But what about that first one? And it's just a simple throw a wet throwaway line of like, oh, I want to get that annulled. It was something that happened in the past. We don't see her. We don't know much about her, but they bring it up because they know if we don't, people are going to start pointing fingers and, uh, uh, uh that's, well, that's a plot that, hole. One line in Breaking Bad where he's like, I once convinced a woman to sleep with me because I told her I was Kevin Costner. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and she believed it because I believed uh-huh. it. And then we just have a scene where like Saul wakes up next to a woman. And she's like, so Kevin Costner? It's like, or whatever it was. And she's remember. looking at his face and like, you're not Kevin Costner. Yeah. I was last night. <laughs> <laughs> Just stupid little clever bits, and because a lot of time when you do callbacks and like references, sometimes it's like so on the nose. Just like you kind of roll your eyes. Yeah. But like anytime there was anything with this, you're just like, damn, they're fucking smart. And and it really in the last episodes where we get Walter White and uh, Jesse Pinkman back, it could have easily been just a oh my god, they're just doing it to be like oh look, it's them. But all those scenes made sense and were you know perfectly integrated. I mean, we even got fucking Marie back. Never oh, would I, can't I have thought. She showed up. Yeah, and I, so the only two people that of significance that never came back was uh, Skylar White and Walt Jr. We never, we never got to see him. Uh, she got name dropped, but they they never came back for anything. Oh yeah, because Hank showed up in the earlier season, yeah. right? Yeah, Hank yeah. and Gomez. Yeah, Hank and Gomez. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Woo. Yeah. So, but we'll get to the final season. Yeah, yeah. Let's. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, anything else about Nacho? Just. I, I look forward to seeing him do other stuff. Uh, I hope he becomes a scorpion in the Spider-Man movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, if not, fuck him. Give him a different character, because that guy's too good not to yeah. be part of your universe. Uh, Howard Hamlin. Howard Hamlin. Uh, probably the most annoying character on the show. Yeah. And for like, if you ask me what his whole purpose was in the first four seasons of the show, I really don't remember all that much he was just kind of like a foil for jimmy it's like but a lot of times he was like trying to help jimmy but mm-hmm. jimmy hated him because he just seemed so like two-faced yeah. and we kind of hated him because he's just like so smug and just seems uh-huh. like big that, perfect smile tan face perfect hair yeah, perfect suit he, like it's weird that like he's this you he, he, like by the end you're just like wow he was just a really nice guy yeah he just came off sleazy yeah where it's like jimmy's a sleazeball mm-hmm. but you root for, <laughs> yeah. for jimmy yeah uh 
Patrick Fabian is the actor. Another yeah. actor I've not really not, seen yeah. in anything, and but just comes in and embodies this character. Yeah. They um, did talk in the beginning, like when in the fir- his first scenes, he was playing it kind of like super evil and mm, I'm the bad scummy lawyer. And they're like, oh, you know, just play this like a normal guy because we don't know where your character is going. And I think because of how nice and likable he is just in, in real yeah. life, the character went that way. That This character could easily been like a super yeah, mega I can see villain. Him go like do some real vindictive. Yeah. Like he's got that kind of Patrick Bateman, American Psycho yeah. vibe to him. Yeah. He reminds me, and it's just like a throwaway joke on Parks and Rec, but he reminds me of the like guy who was like going to be governor or whatever that Adam Scott was like promoting. And he just like was sitting in the office like silently and just, he was just, oh, like, a yeah. smiley, just like a smiley face. Yeah. He was like an alien or a robot or something. <laughs> yeah. And he was just like, he just sat there like perfectly still mm-hmm. for like six hours. Yeah. Like that's kind of like the vibe he reminded me of is like, oh, he's just like, if you're putting a guy on a poster as like a political figure or whatever, mm-hmm. like he's your like You can see a vote for yeah, whoever, yeah. He's like the model of like, oh, that guy is a hard like he looks like every Republican ever mm-hmm. kind of thing. Uh but But like we we see him, you know, like break down thinking he was to blame for Chuck's death, and then Jimmy just kinda like lets him he's like, Well, I guess that's your cross to bear and just lets him believe that it could possibly be his fault and, and he tries to extend his hand to Jimmy so many times of offering him jobs, but Jimmy just like throws bowling balls on his car. And no matter what he does, he wants to just squash the beef and just be a good person. Mm-hmm. And they refuse to, and it ends up getting him killed. It's like the, the biggest tragedy of the show, like Nacho dying sucks, but at least but his dad he, survived yeah. and he went out on his own terms. And all, like, yeah, he, his dad survived. He went on his own terms and it was like, a death of his own making like it was mm-hmm. it was uh it was unescapable yeah like living that kind of life you're probably gonna end up in jail or dead and mm-hmm. that's just how it is yeah but howard was just in the wrong place wrong time yep. and he was there because of direct actions by mm-hmm. jim uh jimmy and uh kim and yeah. he didn't he didn't deserve that he yeah he was, if he just decided to come a different day sleep it off and talk to him in the morning everything would have been different. It's just such a tragic thing. And it's been mentioned before, probably by everyone. Uh, But when we have that scene and you see the candle flicker, when Howard comes in, you understand the door just opened. It created a draft. Someone's walking in and then having them just talk together and it flickers again. And they both look at it like the dread that came over me because I knew it was Lalo, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I did not know how this was going to be. Cause it's like, of course they can't just kill Howard right here. He's going to have to get out. And like, no, Lalo just looks at him and blows him away. Like he's in- insignificant. Oh, I need to talk to these people. You're here. I need to get rid of you so I can do my thing. Just w- completely with, uh, without a care in the world. And it's not like a surprise. Like you knew the second he walks in that room, he's, gonna die because you've showed multiple seasons of Lalo Salamanca just murdering people he likes indiscriminately because it's like you're in my way like he he killed those like two farmer people because he he needed to like a body double pretty much a a body double make people believe he was still dead yeah yeah he he paid for this guy's dental surgery so he would have the same exact teeth as him so if he needed to he could kill this dude burn the body and be able to get out that's insane that's another character we need to talk about. Lola. Yeah, I was. I didn't want to interrupt you. Sure, Let's sure. Do, uh, How- uh, but Howard stuff. Yeah. Anything yeah. else with ha- Howard? Uh, no. Howard. Once again, every sh- every character on the show is like someone who's like, ah, they're okay in the be, or I like them in the beginning a lot, but by the end, I'm just like, man, they were great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Howard's great, and he didn't deserve what happened to him, and he was just a he's a good person, but he kind of needed. Like, every character on the show, even Kim, like, yeah, she's a good person, but she's doing bad shit. Mm -hmm. Howard never did anything bad. No. Like, the worst thing he did was just kind of be dickish or uppity. Yeah. But, like, that's not a reason to, like, get murdered. No, not at all. Or to, like, torture this guy for years and years. It's like, especially because he was, like, trying to help you for Mm -hmm. a lot of it. You just didn't want to take the help. Uh, So, Howard's great. And and if, like, the actions of Kim and Jimmy got Mike Ehrmantraut killed, it wouldn't affect them nearly as much but the fact that it killed the nicest person in the show the person that didn't deserve it he was innocent 100 percent innocent and it was the the necessary catalyst to to end the rest of it and it's just just beautiful uh so yeah lala salamanca 
what what a villain. Yeah. Because in a, in a series, in a universe where we have been introduced to a ton of great villains. Mm-hmm. Tuco, uh, Tuco, Hector, Gus, Mike in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Nazis in Breaking Bad. The Nazis. Uh, the, the twins. Uh, uh, what's her name? The the evil, like, uh, she works for uh, Madrigal. Oh. Lydia? Uh, Lydia, yeah. Uh, great villain. Even though it's not she's going to pull a gun on you, but, yeah. like, she's so cold and calculating. Great villain. Yeah. Uh, Walt. <laughs> Walt, yes. Uh, uh, Jesse Plemons' character, uh, whose name I forget. Uh, Todd. Todd, yeah. Fucking Todd. So it's just, like, all these great kind of iconic characters who most of them are just kind of, like, brooding weird uh, or like they're either scary big tough guys or just like kind of weirdos mm-hmm. and then you just have this guy who's just like handsome charming smart great and just, smile just a great smile like he just makes you trust him and he's like able to like jump to these roles and like when he like travels to germany and like is like can seduce a woman <laughs> seducing a woman. Like, this guy is just like the worst villain yeah and i mean the best most uh, enjoyable villain to watch just because you're just like, oh, yeah, I could meet this guy at a bar and have a great conversation. And it's like, oh, hey, man, you want to come back to my house and, like, have another beer? It's like, yeah, bro, yeah, let's sure. do it. And then it's like, while well, he's there, it's like, hey, have you heard of Huey and the News or whatever? <laughs> and chop my fucking head off. Like, such a such a fantastic villain. Yeah, one of the first scenes we see of him, he goes to, like, a, a payday loan store or a, something, a wire transfer place. Wants to get some information from this nerdy clerk and just like jumps into the ceiling, drops down, kills the dude. Just, you know, he just has to get the information. Like, will you give it to me? No? Okay. Well, I guess you have to die. And he's just very nonchalant about anyone he kills. Yeah. And it's very interesting because like so much of the show is like planning and planning and planning and like having being two steps or five steps ahead. Like Gus is so calculated and so stone faced. And it's like, He's going to have to, like, buy this underground bunker that he can do this stuff with so he can kill this person to bury them there. So no mm-hmm. one ever, like, he's got plans on top of plans where Lalo, like, he'll go into a situation like, mm, he seems like a problem. Kill them mm-hmm. and cover it up in, like, 10 seconds. Yeah. And it's like, it's never an or issue. Or kill them and I get out of here. Yeah, and, and just, who cares? It doesn't matter. Yeah, because yeah. they'll never find me. Uh-huh. Uh, but is also willing to hang out in a sewer for, for days, days. And, days. Yeah. and planning to get into the laundromat and hang out in the rafters in the pipes for days if necessary. Yeah, when it comes to like, you know, for lack of a better term, like nobodies or peasants or whatever, it's like I can kill them indiscriminately and it's not going to raise any red flags mm-hmm. or whatever because, oh, just wrong per- wrong place, wrong time. Uh, if I'm going after Gus, I have to be smart because this yeah. motherfucker is the smartest guy in the mm-hmm. room. Uh, but when you have like all these stone-faced robot characters, having this charming guy is a great foil to Gus. Especially, and, like, their dynamic is really fun. Because, mm-hmm. like, they, they want to kill each other but can't kill each other because they're under the... They're on the same team, the really. Same team, yeah. really. They can't reveal their true plans. I mean, Lalo constantly was trying to say, at least, you know, to Hector, like, the the chicken man is the, is the bad dude. And, and Gus would just have to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a normal guy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Lalo's great. Yeah. Um, and I, well, we've seen him in the Hawkeye show, so I think you're going to yeah. see a lot more of him. And he was fun on that show too. Oh yeah. Tony Dalton is going to be a superstar. Yeah. He's, he's too charming to. And it's weird. Cause he looks like, I mean, he's a very handsome man, but mm-hmm. like I, if you told me he was like 55, it'd be like, okay. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, who gets like this kind of resurgence so late? And it's like, what did he look like in his twenties? I bet he was fucking a oh, yeah. stud. Yeah, it's like, and he looks this good in his fifties, and now his career is taking off. So interesting. So, hey. I need to like look back on his IMDb profile because yeah. I really don't know what he's done. Yeah, and like, uh, uh, what's his name who plays who plays Mike? Yeah, he's been in the business forever, but did you know anything he was in until he nope. showed up in Breaking Bad? <laughs> and yeah. he is an elderly man. That that's another yeah yeah, yeah. touche. Uh, I, I one before we get to the the final season, I I, I really like how when we watch Breaking Bad. We feel we feel for Gus because the Salamanca has like killed his boyfriend and his partner right in front of him. Oh yeah, that scene with Gus at the bar with the wine. It was so nice to see him just be a person uh-huh. and not this crazy criminal. I, I I wanted more of that, but I get it. We don't have time for all of it. But it was nice that they had at least one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then so him wanting to get revenge on the Salamancas and he like poisons the alcohol and everything. It's great. Oh, we're rooting for oh, Gus. Yeah. And then like when Hector blows him up, it, like we understand he is kind of torturing Hector by keeping him in this old folks home. 
And but you get it so much more of why Hector is was willing to allow to kill himself to get rid of Gus because he was such so anti Gus this this whole season and knew something was up and it's it's a little satisfying knowing that he finally gets to have his revenge even though he is also a scumbag I I really liked their dynamic. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you want to just any before we get into the final season just thoughts on Mike and Gus since they're major parts of the show yeah and... good I mean I, I do wish there was a time where they could just have a normal conversation mm-hmm. it, everything was business with yeah. them it would have been nice like what do they talk about when there is downtime does he ever go like uh, so I heard you're introducing a new sauce called French you know <laughs> is it good you know anything oh the, your spice curls how, how are they you know, just something yeah like I understand I just to be Gus must be so exhausting to be like living two lives, li- living two lives constantly just for the sake of revenge that takes 20 years to yeah. do, or whatever the amount of time it was yeah. just seems like a lot. And I, I, I agree. I do like the scene where he's like talking to that guy about wine and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just nice to have, but it's like, it's just like that moment. And then the moment with his uh, boyfriend or partner or whatever it was, it's like, we only get like two scenes of Gus being like kind of, happy because yeah. you know like when he's talking to like the charities he's working for mm-hmm. or like these or the being, cops or like or he's at the uh counter at the uh apoyo loco whatever it's called apoyo, Hermanos, apoyo, uh, yeah. <laughs> apoyo loco is the real thing yeah yeah uh <laughs> he was just like oh hi sir how you doing like yeah. can i get you a refill it's mm-hmm. like you know that's an act so yeah. to just see him do anything is is nice uh but yeah so um Yeah, I've kind of oh, lost my train um, of thought. So he had that scene with the guy with the wine, but then after he is killed, everybody knows Gus Fring was this big drug dude. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Walter White really uh, blew the roof off that. I wonder if that wine guy was just like, what the fuck? That guy? I thought he was just like some dude who, who was hitting on me. Mm-hmm. Hey, he was a drug kingpin? Like, I, 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 it, imagine someone that you work with all of a sudden dies and you find out that like they were a secret billionaire and they just loved, you know, stocking shelves. <laughs> I'd have been like, holy shit. I should have been that guy's friend. <laughs> that <would be> my <laughs> only Fuck. Uh, yeah, let's go to, let's go to season six. Okay. So at the end of season five, where are we left off? Cause season four ended with, um, him changing his name. Him he, changing his name. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's all good, man. Yeah. Uh, th- I mean, I guess it ended with after they were trying to get the Mesa Verde like logo taken down. Uh, they're like, we can go bigger. And we don't really know what that is. Mm-hmm. I think that's the... Is it the episode where he... Uh, was it the episode before where Nacho tries to execute Lalo? I think it's the episode before. Oh, yeah. No, that may be the end because I think it ends with with Lalo walking into the desert. Yeah, it was it was the big the big shootout. Okay, yeah. Saul and Mike had to walk through the desert with all that money, and Nacho was uh, s- allowing the like a SWAT team to come in and kill all of uh, Lalo's uh, family. And so we start. Well, was it his family? Or just his. Well, the mission was to kill Lalo and just kill Lalo and the crew that was there. And then whoever's think. there. Yeah, it's yeah. not like, oh, we got to kill his grandma. But <laughs> but grandma was there and grandma died. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so we started this season. Yeah, we, we never mentioned like every season started with a little flash forward of post Breaking oh, yeah. Bad, black and white things. And most of them are pretty mundane. Cinnabon manager working in a mall in Nebraska, reliving his glory days, watching his VHS tapes. And, and you know, it's a cute little thing that that was kind of like his intro. The The intro to the show was his tape. And every season they got, they degraded more and more. Mm-hmm. And this last season, it, it, it was great. Just like really cut into blue and simple text and really good stuff. Uh, but someone has recognized him and wants to get in the game. And so he... Because uh, that was, when that first happened, that was like a season three thing? Wasn't no, it? no, it was at the end of season five. 
Where someone recognized him? Yeah. Oh, he okay. sees him, and then, like, he gets in a cab, and he has, like, an Albuquerque yeah, 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 yeah. thing. I mean, it may have been, like, an end of season four, end of season five, because we only saw it, like, one time per right, season. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, he's not satisfied with just, like, living in obscurity. He's got to kind of get back into it, and we get more slipping, slipping gene sort mm-hmm. of uh, things, and we get Carol Burnett. Uh, Who, when was the last time she did anything? I don't know, but she I mean, was again, great. Yeah, she was great. I I guarantee this is my prediction. She wins an Emmy for best guest actress in a series. You think so? I I a hundred like I'm putting money. Okay. On her winning the Emmy for that. So as we talked about, like Nacho dies, Howard dies, all these things kind of happen in the first seven episodes because there was thirteen. Mm-hmm. So Howard dies at episode seven, and then episode. Eight. Kim breaks up with with Jimmy. She realizes it's too much. We're bad for each other. We need to separate. And one of the the big questions when watching the show was like, what's going to be the thing that really truly turns him into Saul Goodman? Sure, he uses the name sometimes. He's doing all these things. He's wearing the outfits, but he hasn't really gone whole hog. Because if you watch Breaking Bad, he's He's kind of an asshole. He's like hitting on Francesca and, and he's just a, a real big scumbag. And he's not that person with Kim around. And it's like, duh, of course it's going to be her breaking up with him. That mm-hmm. that sends him over the edge. And and watching every season, it's just like, oh, this is going to be it. This is going to be it. And it's not until one of the final episodes that he finally, you know, breaks bad, I guess, and, and, and goes really into it. And everything that gets revealed in these later episodes are just make the most sense. It, everybody's predicting, oh, well, this person's going to die or Kim's going to call the vacuum person and get her life changed and, and all of it. No, it's just real simple, real logical stuff. And, 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 and there's At which the show has always been. Always done. And all, Breaking Bad was the same. Just, and, and we should have known. We should have seen it. But, like, I don't think I saw – this ending really being predicted. I mean, we talked in our personal lives about, yeah, Saul's going to end up in prison. Yeah, I think a lot of people assume that's where he would go. Mm-hmm. And there, and I think a lot of people said, well, there's no way they're going to do that because we're all saying it. Mm-hmm. But it is a logical choice. Yeah. So it makes It's like, what more a pro- poetic place for a lawyer to go than to jail? Yeah, he's a criminal lawyer because he is a criminal. He would be with other criminals. But unlike cops going to jail, there's no stigma of a lawyer going to prison and everyone wants to beat the shit out of you. They actually respect him and they chant his, his, his name over and over again. And he may be in the worst place he could be, but he's all right. He's going to do fine. He's going to thrive. Like he's working in the kitchen and someone's just like, hey, I'll cover you, man. And like everybody's got his back. I think he's going to be the guy everyone goes to for questions about what their lawyer should do. And I'm sure he's going to be real chummy with the guards. Like, he's fine. Yeah, he's... <laughs> he may be put away for 87 years or whatever it yeah, was. Yeah, he'll but, die in prison. Yeah. Uh, well, but, you know, he did say with good behavior, maybe there's... Yeah. Like, if anyone can, like, convince themselves, uh, convince everyone to, like, let him go, mm-hmm. it'd be Saul Goodman. Especially if, like, the inmates aren't going to fuck with him. Yeah. If the guards aren't going to fuck with him. Yeah. If he's just, like... He's yeah, fine. I, yeah, I just he has his nine to five working in the kitchen mm-hmm. essentially. He's got his buddy. I'm, I'm sure he doesn't really have like friends there, yeah. but you know everyone would believe he's their mm-hmm. friend. Just like, and oh, the man, stories I gotta... he could tell. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you worked for Gus, the the mm-hmm. kingpin. Like, oh man, you're so cool. Oh, you fought for the little man. He's kind of like a, a local folk hero. Yeah, because he like fought for the weak and downtrodden. But mm-hmm. really, he's just like I was just like taking you guys for all you were worth. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like they needed a champion. Mm-hmm. He's the guy who got people off. And and it's it's nice that we got that whole scene of him talking down his sentence. Like they had multiple life sentences for the crimes he did, and he they life talk, plus like eighty seven. Yeah, something. and he got it down to like seven, seven years. years. Crazy. And it it just really proves he is one of the best lawyers. He's not just a scumbag. He is good. And sure, he probably should have taken that deal, but he needed to prove to Kim. He, he is a, a good person and it was it, it's like everything he's always done through his whole career is just kind of like spitting in the face of the courts and other lawyers of like look you want to play by those rules I'll play by my own and I'm going to come out on top and even though he doesn't get a good deal he mm-hmm. proved I'm better than you I was able to get you down to this and I'm choosing to do this thing 
Yeah, like the pre- the predictable thing would be him going to jail, and then the show's kind of going like, oh, he's able to talk his way. Out. It's like one of my favorite shows of all time is The Shield, and I think it has one of the best finales of all time. And in that finale, uh, spoiler for The Shield, <laughs> it's like he gets away with all of his crimes by giving up everyone mm-hmm. he's like i'm gonna every crime i've ever commit committed i'm gonna admit to every person who's i've ever done dirt with i'm gonna give them up so they can go to jail or whatever and it's gonna get me off scot-free and i'm gonna get a job yeah and it's like it's a job he like has to work at for a while and mm-hmm. hate or whatever because he, he, he's, he's gonna be he's, stuck he's, on he's the desk lost everything like yeah. that's the big thing he's lost everyone he's ever cared for and he's lost the job he loved but he got away mm-hmm. and it's like that's sort of like what they did with this show too mm-hmm. which i love it's just they it's like, oh, I could have kind of gotten out of jail, but you he, he's a better person than uh, Vic Mackey. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. Not by much, but a little bit. Um, because Saul never murdered anybody. He never actually murdered anybody. With the, yeah, you could argue the Chuck thing, which he kind of goes, sure. I did kill my brother. Sure. Um, but it's not like he said he kicked the lantern over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he got Howard killed. He got his brother killed, but he didn't actually pull. It's not like Walt, who choked out was it crazy eight in the third episode (laughs) you know he murdered someone that quickly uh yeah exactly uh but uh, just what a great great finale and what a show that you know you marketed as a you know drug sleaze con man show uh intense drama and at the end of the day it was just kind of a love story between jimmy and kim and i like that you know maybe they can't be together in the traditional sense but she can come visit him because yeah she's able to like be his lawyer and they can just talk and be together it's like because do you think she would come visit him because i think like her saying bye and him giving the finger guns it was just like a we are done here yeah I, i've seen comments where uh people kind of go like it's open to interpretation cause yeah. some people go like i think she does come back and visit mm-hmm. um because they are in, like, they do love each other. Yeah, and they, they went are, through some shit. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, she is dating that other guy in the finale. <laughs> yep. The yep guy. <laughs> oh, so stupid. <laughs> but so funny. Uh, but, like, she has made her life so devoid of choice mm-hmm. because her previous choices got an innocent man killed. Yeah. And just seems like, oh, my life is all. But because. She turned in the information and like was willing to like yeah I'll go to jail too if yeah. I have to kind of thing or like whatever but doesn't because there's no evidence of it yeah, just her word yeah it's like but I've given up this information I am just Kim and I have to deal it's like both characters became who they truly are mm-hmm. at the end and I think that I like to think that she would come back and visit sure. especially because she was just like oh I got to keep my lawyer license I I can be here it's like do I expect them to like be in a relationship no but it's just. We had something beautiful, and we'll reminisce mm. from time to time. And and she, I, she's getting back into being a lawyer, just doing the volunteer work, doing the thing that she yeah. always loved. Uh, so I, I don't think that the next time she sees Jimmy will be at his funeral or okay. whatever. I, uh, I'd like I'd like to hope that that's what it is. I, yeah, I don't but, want him to never see her again. Uh, if if that's the idea of just like we're done here, goodbye, and they never see each other again, I'm also fine with that ending because yeah. I think it's. Also, she very, would have to put that part of herself. Yeah, I, I think away. that's beautiful as well. But I think mm-hmm. the reason that another reason that she would come back and visit is because oh, he's not Saul anymore. There, there's there's sure. no reason for him to be Saul. Yeah, he's he just can just Jimmy. be Jimmy in prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's Saul to the prisoners, but he'll never be Saul to Kim. Yes. Um, but yeah, if they never see each other again i'd be okay with that ending but me personally i like to believe that she does come back um well did we get any gus mike stuff in the finale uh there when he's asking about the time travel question there's a oh, scene yeah, with, yeah, mike, with mike which i really love that and i, I didn't notice this because i like i said i'm a dumb dumb uh and after i watch an episode instantly read it the Better Call Saul subreddit. I want to just hear what everybody thought yeah. because people are just so much better at going, oh, hey, you notice how like his commercials were in color and his glasses? Oh, that happened in the first episode. Don't remember that happening nope. in the first episode, but I'm glad there are other people who've rewatched it enough times that they catch things. Uh, but so Jimmy asks Mike, if you could have a time machine, what would you do? And Mike gives a really 
you know, personal, important, life-changing thing about really changing his future and going back and stopping himself from ever being a cop. And Saul says, I want money, Mm -hmm. pretty much. And then when he asks Walt, it's the flip side. And Walt is pretty much like, oh, my big regret is my company that I started and how much money I could have actually made and I wouldn't be in this situation. And Walt and uh, Jimmy says, I'd go back and not be slipping Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and both of their responses are, are great because Mike says, like, really? It's just about money? And Walt says, like, oh, you were like this your whole life. And right. it's like, this is who he is. He just wants money, and he's a scumbag. And uh, I just I, I thought that was a, a nice parallel. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, back to the Walter White and Jesse Pickman cameo. Like, the, the first, like... Ever since episode one, they're like, when's Walt yeah. and Jesse going to show up? It's like, who fucking cares? Like, yeah. I, I think from the very beat, like from season one, you and I were kind of like, if they never showed up, I wouldn't it's fine. care. Because well, I always assumed it would just show. be a, them walking by in the background. They're in line at a coffee shop at the same time. And like they have a some sort of conversation, but they don't remember each other later on down the line. Yeah. It'd be something throwaway. Or I thought stupid. like one of the final scenes would just be like cut to jimmy on his knees with a bag over his head and mm-hmm. you just hear like walt's voice and you go yeah. like oh they're yeah. here and just like oh this is the point where the show ends yeah. is when they pick up but like, uh, nope but no that's no. not what that's not what they do i mean they do do that scene yeah but it carries on to a scene we've never seen before yes. um so yeah when they first showed up i didn't care about that scene it's like mm-hmm. oh that's nice that they're here but like i i don't really care about the scene it's not until the next episode where like Jesse has a heart to heart with Kim where I was mm-hmm. like, okay, this is the kind of cameo I wanted to see. Yeah. It's like it came out of nowhere. I didn't expect Jesse to show up again. I thought it was going to be this one cameo from those mm-hmm. two and that's it. And then I didn't expect Walt to come in and have yeah. his own scene with Jimmy mm-hmm. in the finale. So I was like, I liked those two extra scenes because I forgot how much of a fucking piece of shit Walt was. Yeah. And just can't leave well enough alone. Has uh-huh. to like fiddle with this heater. You know, he has to be in control of every little thing that he's doing and just is so, so fucking rude to, to, to Saul just about like a simple question. And it's like, oh, you want to talk about regrets? Let's talk about regrets. And, but, but I love that they're able to just jump back into those characters like it was nothing. Mm-hmm. Walter White has never left Brian Cranston. No, he, probably he, never will. No, he could turn that on whenever. <laughs> and, and hopefully when he's 80 years old and, and he's retired and we see him on some late night talk show, he'll, he'll pull it out and say, I'm the one who knocks. You know, I am the danger something. And, yeah. and, and just be, we'll all Woo! clap. Yep. Remember that thing? <laughs> yeah. And I know what that is. And it's fun seeing, you know, if you have your two leads of Walt and Jesse and Kim and Jimmy, it's like, here's Kim at the end of her journey with uh, Saul. And here's uh, Jesse about to start his journey with mm-hmm. Walt. Walt. Yeah. And then both Walt and Jimmy kind of at the end of their relationship together. Mm-hmm. And one is just like still gung ho about like, all the stuff he didn't accomplish and one's just like I wish I could just change everything versus the one who's just like I wish I you know yeah. my empire could whatever mm-hmm. whatever uh, so it's fun seeing like those kind of dualities yeah. man uh, I, I mean we could really talk about the show sure for, I mean like forever in the, the first the first episode we see uh, the like FBI cleaning out his house and we see like the, the time machine book which had no relevance until much until mm-hmm. the final episode, which we got to see Michael McKean again. And that, uh, that oh, scene yeah, yeah, yeah. actually takes place right before the first episode. It's like the, the day before. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was actually a better call Saul prequel in, in that one scene. <laughs> um, but yeah, that book uh, there's, you know, the, the painting that, that, you know, Howard had his brains blown out. Uh, but then like, his cardboard standout or cardboard standee gets mm-hmm. thrown into a dumpster and Gene is found in the dumpster by the cops. You know, it's like little things like that. They're just, just so damn good about I, God, how they haven't made like a documentary. Like there really should have been uh, a team of people who just like recorded all the writer room stuff. And I would watch a thousand hours. Oh on yeah. It. Like my, my, one of my favorite things is all the behind the scenes stuff they did for Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. of just like, a hundred there's like a hundred hours of that shit <laughs> on the fucking extended edition yeah. blu-rays it's like give me a hundred hours of just vince gilligan and i think peter gould yeah, is peter the, gould. and just the writing staff there just like how how the fuck did they write these shows 
It's just to, just to say something like, oh, well, he's going to pull up next to a car. Well, let's make that car be the car he gets in the future just as a little nod. Okay, cool. Let's do that. And just like being able to pull every little detail. I want to see the whiteboards. I want to see the yeah. notes with like a thousand scribbles and like red <laughs> ink going over the black Big ink. Big circles. Big, yeah. it's, it's just like I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm flabbergasted that yeah. people had made the show because it's like. There's tons of great shows out there. This is the best time to watch television. Oh, like, yeah. there's always, it's like, if Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul didn't exist, you know, would we still be talking? Would The Wire still be the pinnacle of sure. television? Yeah. You know, or The Sopranos? It's like, there's so much great television, and you go, like, wow, great writing, great acting, great directing. It's all great. Game, Game of Thrones, whatever. And it's like, then you look at this show, and just every episode is just enhanced more from the episode before, and just, it's, it's a perfect circle, mm-hmm. and there's just like nothing wrong with it. People naturally nitpick everything. You, yeah. It's nearly impossible to nitpick the show because they like they thought of everything yeah. that I can that I can think of, and they've made it better than anything should be made. It, <laughs> it, uh, they need to teach classes on this show. I'm yeah. sure they probably do. Maybe they do. But uh, man, it's I I work with two people and one person said he tried to watch the show wasn't his thing and he stopped i was like oh you did you not like breaking back oh i never saw it okay well that's that's part of the problem. Part, part of the problem then i have another person she refuses to watch the last episode of breaking bad because she doesn't want it to end she doesn't want to I've see how it people ends like that and it drives me insane and it's like well i'm not going to watch better call saul because it will spoil that ending and like if you love something so much Finish it off. See, see it and, and embrace it. And if you love it so much, you can rewatch it. But just to like bl- close your eyes to it being over is ridiculous. But okay, I mean, I mean, it, it's bringing me to a, the subject of a rewatch. If you were going to rewatch it, would you do Breaking Bad then Better Call Saul, or would you do Better Call Saul than Breaking Bad? Because I'm thinking you do Better Call Saul up until season six, episode seven, and you stop there. Then Ramon's you watch. Death. Yeah, Howard's death. Howard's death, and then you watch Breaking Bad. So, because you know, not that it spoils anything, because you already know it, but it it would be neat to kind of like actually see things a little more chronologically. Mm-hmm. So, I think that's what I'm gonna do when I go back through it. I'm gonna stop at a certain point, rewatch Breaking Bad, then jump back to it and just see how that feels. Because I would love to take two people who've seen neither and go, you go Better Call Saul, Breaking Bad. You go Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and just see how they feel about it afterwards. Or it's like, yeah, you stop at Howard, you watch all of Breaking Bad, watch El Camino, then jump back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah, you would. Actually, yeah. I think I would probably do El Camino last anyways. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, I guess timeline-wise it does make sense, but I think... Timeline, but I think it is a, a nice cap because it ends mm-hmm. happily, yeah. in quotations. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess this ends happily too, in quotations, too, but it's yeah. more of a bummer than El Camino is, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we could talk forever. Yeah, I, but I'm running out of battery, so we got to wrap it up. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say other than it's it's been a journey. I don't think we'll ever get any other stuff in the Breaking Bad universe. Hey, we didn't think we'd get an El Camino yeah. movie, so there can be a, another movie. Yeah, I mean, if there's more stuff and Vince Gilligan and his team are behind it, I'm for it. I will be it. there. I yep. will watch it. I'm sure I will love it. Uh, but if this is the end. So be it. So be it. And I'm happy it ended this way. And I love all these actors. I love these characters. Uh, it it just makes the biggest bummer is that it's over. We're probably never going to get anything like it again. Not for a long time. Not for a while. Yeah. And anything Vince Gillian, Gillian makes after this. It's going to be instantly compared. Instantly, it probably won't be as good. No. Uh, because it, cause it's not just he's a good writer and director. It's you're getting the right actors, the right lighting people, the right studio, the right everything mm-hmm. to make it all work. Because he's not a one-man show. Yeah, because I mean, he's made another show after and a Breaking Bad yeah. and a tank. It was like Buddy Cop Show or something. On like Fox that. or something? Yeah. yeah. It's just, uh, it just like, oh, that's what you followed up Breaking Bad with? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so we'll, well see. I give it a B minus. <laughs> it's like you know you can like watch a score, uh, Spielberg or a score, like you know or Nolan or some shit. It's mm-hmm. like you know whatever they make after this is probably gonna be good. Even yeah. if it's not gonna be Jurassic Park, but it'll be watchable. Yeah. It's like I don't know if Vince Gilligan has anything left in the chamber. I hope that I'm wrong. Yeah. But if this is clearly his magnum opus, and he mm-hmm. will never make anything better. Than I wonder this. if he'd be 
like how a movie, Gould. like short form storytelling, if if that wouldn't be his thing, like he needs time to really stretch it out, or would he be good condensing some of this stuff? So it'd be interesting to see. Uh. All right, well. Well, thanks for listening to our Better Call Saul talk. We could have gone on for many hours because we have gone on for hours in our real life. But if you want to reach out to us, tell us what you thought about Better Call Saul and its six-season run. We are at WRPL Podcast on Gmail, Twitter, and Instagram. And as always, I'm Ben. And I'm Steve. Good night.